Hi, it's Splinterverse. Welcome to another episode of D&D New Releases, where we offer first impressions of new third-party products for Dungeons & Dragons. We cover up to 20 titles from Dungeon Masters Guild and up to 20 more from Drive Through RPG each week. The titles are presented in alphabetical order by site, and all of them are linked in the video description. Purchasing the books using those links helps the channel, but you can also support us by purchasing one of our best-selling titles. We've got lineages suitable for any setting, as well as optional lineage rules in our Van Richten's Librum of Lineages. With our Potions Unlocked book, we have over 100 pages of material to take potions to the next level in your game. Our Feywild Companion offers 150 pages of Feywild fun for players and DMs alike. Also, our book Fizzban's Vault of Draconic Secrets contains over 50 pages of dragon-themed player options, including a subclass for each class and much more. Please support the channel by purchasing our books using the links in the video description. This week's episode focuses on titles released between October 29th and November 4th, 2021. We've got lots of 5th edition content with some OSR thrown in there as well. Everything from adventures, crafting subclasses, you name it, it's in here. So stay tuned all the way to the end so you don't miss a title. First up, we have The Church of the Unknown God. It's an adventure for 5th to 7th level characters, written for worlds without number, but can be used by other OSR systems. It's $3.99 for 45 pages from Parts Per Million with author Marcus Locke. It says it's the third installment of the Swords of Light series, but it can be played standalone. Um, or as part of a sequence and uh, you can see here they've got hex maps description of things occupants then they've got this cool map of a ground floor it looks like a maybe a busted up church or something um, and then down here the rest of this the, the rest of the series so that's cool you can you can see and it looks like there's a fourth one coming so you could get in now and, and be around for when the fourth one comes out uh, let's see what uh, the interior looks like. It looks like the full-size preview is broken, Marcus, so you might want to take a look at that. I know that happens on this site, so uh, you might have to reduce the number of pages or um, make sure you've got the right PDF selected. But it looks nice in here. Look at this nice village. Got information on who owns the pub, the baker, the miller, all that good stuff. And you've got something called the Smart Twig Inn. And then wandering monsters and uh, local area map occupants on the map and then here's here's the church yep i was right it's a church so you can see you've got the roof even which is nice you could have a battle on the roof i guess ground floor so you get to see quite a bit of it i think you get to see the whole book and it's readable in this format uh, and a lot of times in this quick preview you can't read read the book so you could literally read the whole adventure here and make up your mind that looks nice too i like the colors here so we'll find something to read early on here i think you can read it um, as well so it says the church of the unknown god there are remains of an old road east of the village which travels into the wood this leads towards the church of the unknown god the road winds in in way through the woods leading further into a dense woodland the wood will become even more difficult going riding at night on a successful skill check it's nav navigable otherwise the pcs will need to walk as the pcs progress further into the wood the road gradually gets too difficult to follow on horseback so if they are riding they will need to lead their horses as the pcs draw closer to the church an old and dirty figure steps out onto the track in front of them the old hermit who is mostly mad is called shea whitfield he raves about the church being haunted and tells the adventurers to be careful if questioned on a successful check, he will briefly tell them that there are skeletons and zombies, but there is worse downstairs. He then re reverts back to mumbling about the lights. He will refuse any help and will not come with the PCs and will end the encounter by running back into the woods. So that's a cool little intro to the adventure with this sort of mad person showing up and raving about what's going on. So then is, is that information reliable or not? You have to find out. And and uh, explore this this church of the unknown god it sounds fun i like the maps looks like a good time and uh yeah it's got a good number of pages 45 pages is is no joke so check it out 
under Church of the Unknown God in the links below and give it a click. Next, we have Cult Adventures Creature Pack Number 1, Steel Legion Mercenaries, which has 10 unique creatures for 5th edition, 4 regular troops, 3 elite troops, 2 officers, and 1 animal, ranging from CR 1 to 9. And it says a perfect assortment of mercenaries and guards ready to be dropped in any game. So basically, this is some NPCs, villains, army people that you might use for your, your campaign uh, as a DM. Um, you never know when somebody's going to be like, I want to talk to this guy or this gal or this person. And uh, having these stat blocks ready, you can you can say, okay, you want to talk to the, the outrider, you want to talk to the commander, you want to go up to the warhorse, you've got their, their stat blocks ready to go. And even though it's a steel legion here, these could be really interchangeable with other... other uh, factions so let's take a look inside it's 12 pages for this title by the way so you get to see six out of the 12 in here so it gives you some lore on the legion which we'll come back and read in a minute and then you've got what they're calling the regular troops which is the non-elites um, so you've got the steel legion mercenary it's a cr1 so information on it tactical advice and then you're getting into the CR2 and then the carrier. So that's good. You get to see a couple examples here. Let's read the lore. The Steel Legion is a neutral group of cell swords that value their contract above all else. They are not interested in local politics or taking sides in conflicts, but offer their services to protect private property, remove dangerous creatures from the land, or hunt down bandits and other unlawful groups. The Legion does not care for its members' origin. They are all treated as equals among their ranks. To improve one's rank in the, in the Legion, talent and experience are essential. Due to its size and success, the Legion can afford high-quality gear and training for all its troops. The Legion's insignia is a steel helmet in front of cross spears. So, that's cool. And then it's talking about how they have they are blessed with varying degrees of unnatural luck uh, due to a powerful trickster god. So, you might see that happen here with abilities like mercenaries luck uh, once per day whenever the guard fails an attack roll or a saving throw it can re-roll and must use this new roll instead so it mixes it up a little bit makes it a little less run of the mill but what i like is that this steel legion group is is a mercenary group so you can have them be adversaries or allies or just a bystander if you want i mean even in a crowd you could throw in one of these characters uh in a crowd to have uh just be a bystander or something so i like that very cool it's under creature pack one down in the links below give it a click next we have daughter of the dead king it's for osr it's from the strange domain and uh, authors jesse davenport and matthew neff it's five dollars for 36 pages, it says evil has descended on the sinking village of Meyer. As deaths and disappearances increase, whispers of demon possession spread and townsfolk eye their neighbors with growing fear. At the heart of this nightmare is a mysterious young woman desperate to dispatch this evil before it's too late. Will you be the saviors of Meyer or just bodies lost in the bog? And it says it's got low prep time designed for the busy GM to pick up and play. Can be a one shot adventure or a start of a campaign. So that's cool. I like the, the cover art, too. That looks very ominous, something creeping over the horizon. And I like how the crown just kind of keeps on going. Very cool. So you get to see the whole adventure here, which is very kind. So no reason not to take a look and see if this works for you. I, I really like how they've laid it out. Nice logo for the company as well. Very cool um, line art. So they've got system neutral rules mostly. So... You might be able to adapt this to 5th edition. It says, uh, the rules as presented suppose you are familiar with certain famous fantasy RPG, but this adventure can be used with whatever RPG rules you prefer. Um, so that's that's helpful. You might be able to convert it even to something other than Dungeons and Dragons. So, wow, this art is really nice. Here's the Wild Swamp. You've got the chapel. So it looks like the authors are also the artists, so they're super talented. I like the names as well. Yeah, look at all these things they're saying. It's so kind of them to let you look at this whole thing, because you're seeing all their art and everything. 
It says, Meyer is plagued by a demon. At first, the village believed it was a sickness, but they quickly began to see it was something far more evil. Possession stricken at night, the demon-possessed attack with unbridled violence before being slain by the light of dawn, if not sooner, by their horrified fellow villagers. So they are dealing with some stuff in Meyer here. And it shows you how to start things off, and then paranoia, and how it gets higher here. There's a whole table of paranoia. Um, and then roll each night and tells you who died um, as a result of things. Grim occurrences, demonic possession. Wow, this has a lot going on. I like it. And then uh, here's some information that you can read. Looks like, um, I don't know if you read this aloud maybe. Yeah, looks like this is what you read aloud. And then this is information on the Soggy Bottom Inn. It's a fun name about the innkeeper and then Thomas Hurdy. And I, I love the artwork and the way that they're they're doing this book and it's melded together the writing and the art because you know they're doing both the creators, which I, I just love when when that happens. And it reminds me a lot of Mork Borg in terms of the darkness of it and um, the art style. So you could maybe even use it for Mork Borg. Um, but yeah, this is really cool. Hilding the Hilding the Mayor. So there's just so much fun stuff happening in here. I mean, just scrolling through, you guys can see all of this art they've got. Wow, I had not heard of this publisher before. They've probably done a bunch of stuff, and I just, you know, I've only been doing this video series this year, so maybe they've had stuff previously that I just haven't seen. Um, but I really like it. I'm definitely going to be a fan of their stuff and try to check out more of it. But let's just read a little bit of the paranoia table and starting things off. I don't want to spoil too much. So, so starting things off, letter to the Baron. The letter sent by the High Priestess Lyra says to find her at the chapel and that accommodations may be found for the party at the Soggy Bottom Inn. So that that's cool. kind of gives you, you're, you're, you're getting a letter from a High Priestess, you're you can find her at the chapel. You're going to stay at the inn. So it's kind of setting everything up there. And it says, Paranoia starts at one. Each death increases the village's paranoia by one, and the listed effect below takes a place. Takes place. So the first level, after the first death, is wariness of outsiders. Then, as there's a death, it says, Paranoid, muttering, doors are barred at night. No one will come out to help after dark. Prices may increase. And then it just keeps climbing, and that's really cool. And then let's look at the who dies at night. Um, it says roll each night. These are the unfortunate villagers the thing possesses to try and kill the orphan. So number one, Baker secret affair with the Miller causes either one to become grief stricken. Um, two, Miller secret affair with the Baker, etc. Three, blacksmith silver weapons may no longer be crafted, and on and on and on. And then you know six to twelve can be farmers or other villagers. But I just really like that. You've know, got grim occurrences. I mean, you can take some of these things adapt them for other adventures as well use this paranoia table later in another village um, grim occurrences if you don't use all of them in your adventure you can save those off for somewhere else um, but i really love the art love the concept this looks really fun and uh, it's under daughter of the dead king so uh, check it out in the links below give it a click next up we have delver issue number two Res resources for the random rolling referee Designed for use with old school essentials, so that's OSR. Um, Ten dollars for fifty-eight pages from the tabletop engineer and James Floyd Kelly. And it says print copies will be available in December. Um, it's a bi-monthly magazine for GMs of old school. And uh, here's some of the random charts and tables. It's got a day's travel. Townsfolk don't go there. An unusual fountain. Build a brigand. Found map. So this could be some fun little tables to roll on. And let's take a look inside. So you get to see eight of the 58 pages. So here again are, are the, some of those tables, like build a hag. <laughs> that could be fun. Um, so here's a day to travel, and it says you are here. Uh, when your players want to know what's nearby, roll it up. Ten hours of travel will get you there. Roll once, twice, or even three times per hex. So you start here. Um, land elements, water elements, structures, creature camp, special. So you roll here, and then it, based on that, so let's say we roll a three, 
then that means there's going to be structures in whatever whatever hex we're trying to get to here. So then we go to the structures table and then we roll a three again and we get ancient cemetery. And you can you can repeat that uh, to kind of populate these hexes, which is pretty cool. And it tells you, you know, different monsters that could be there. And then uh, down here, I'm guessing this is the names or no, the townsfolk don't go there. So this is another table, that's cool. Okay, so this is the a day's travels table and then this is the town so don't go there so if you roll let's do three here as well so d12 roll first the, the cursed and then swamps of the angry necromancer so the cursed swamps of the angry necromancer would be what we get if we rolled a three across all of these and then it would say it'd be a rumored location of bragmare the lich but there's a lot of flavorful stuff on here and i love tables like this i could spend all day um, if you listen to me talk on these podcasts, you know I used to do this because <laughs> I didn't have a lot of friends and I was a kid and I would just roll on tables and make up dungeons and stuff by myself. And so I have a fondness for tables like this. So I, I, I want to get this at some point and, and roll on all, all these tables because <laughs> they look fun. Um, build a brand. Yep. Cool. And here's a whole thing on wondrous tomes. So you got the warlocks muse. Yeah, I think this is a lot of fun. And you get 58 pages of it for, for $10. So check it out under Delver Magazine, number two, in the links below, and give it a click. Next, we've got Fading Embers, A Frozen Age, Player's Manual uh, from Valiant Fox Gaming and author John A. Yackel. It is $20 for 136 pages. And uh, there are also the Game Master's Manual and the Setting Manual for Fading Embers. They all three came out this week. So we're just talking... Uh, in this video about the player's manual but i wanted you to know that there is like the typical trio of books that you get when a setting launches so keep that in mind in case you want to explore the other titles as well uh, fading embers is a fifth edition setting of the world of nith over 900 years after being thrust into an unnatural ice age so that's a cool setup for a, a frozen dying world that you can play in and it says chapter one guides you through the 27 playable sub races not all the standard races have survived in this new fro frozen age while others that did are forever changed and then there are some never before seen ones like the foundlings and the barbagazi and then you've got 24 new subclasses six new backgrounds new equipment new feats and chapter six discusses how divine magic has changed in the setting and how sorcerers have ascended to dominance in much of Nith. And then there's an updated sorcerer spell list, plus 50 new spells. Uh, so that's that's cool. I like how it's changed 5th edition a little bit in terms of like the standard races are mixed up a little bit. The, the sorcerers got a little bit more control in this, in this setting. Um, so it's mixing things up a little bit. And again, you know, I'm sure with these other two books, it's expanding on that what we just read so let's take a look inside so you get to see 16 of the 136 pages so they're they're plopping us in the middle here which i think is a good strategy so we can really get to see a lot more with the 16 pages so it looks like we're getting to look at the sub races so you've got a caravan dwarf um you got the fey touched foundling and then some goblin sub races lichen blooded and what else you got path of the great man okay so they're they're bouncing around here which is nice to different different pages in the book okay yeah because you can see we went from page 69 to 87 i like that strategy because it gives people a good sampling of stuff so you're getting to see some of the subclasses and then here's a background um and then down here you're getting to see something called lunar transformation for for lycanthropy and then you've got some spells like greater frostbite freezing smite frost spears if you like cold magic this is definitely going to be a good one for you because you know they're they're in an ice age right so let's read about the foundling first generation of this new race have all been born in the last 80 years from the pairings of elves and dwarves inside the grand cities beginning in the horn crest with the birth of a golden skinned girl these foundlings emerged into a world in sporadic and miraculous fashion Couples once believed incapable of creating children together are now watched with unparalleled anticipation by their families, neighbors, and cities. 
These children are dubbed foundlings, not because they were abandoned by their parents, but rather because they represent something new, younger, and vulnerable in a dangerous world, and must be protected by the grand cities. There are currently over 40 such children. Each new foundling is carefully observed as the citizens of the grand city seek to understand the phenomenon. Thus far, no theory has proved infallible in predicting the metallic skin tone's physical features or gender of the infants. Their skin always has metallic appearance, whether dull iron, bright silver, copper, golden, or other variations. Each foundling has an inner luminescence whose brightness corresponds with heightened emotions. So that's fun. They've got this metallic look and they kind of glow and you can see the fun artwork here trying to, to depict that, which is nice. looks like some cool um, coloring on there. And then you've got uh, all the different uh, features that they have. Oh wait, nope, this is a different different one. Okay, so that's that's 12 and then this looks like it's part of, hmm, I'm not sure. Yeah, because they're, they're skipping pages, so I'm not sure. You'll have to look at it and read it, see if you can figure out what it goes with, but it's fine. I mean, it's just getting to show you the quality of the writing. Don't see a lot of typos, easy to read because there's there's white space and there's artwork breaking things up. Uh, that looks like a fun character. So lots of cool artwork in here, lots of content. I mean, even if you just take out a race or take out a, a background and, um, you know, a spell, whatever, and use it elsewhere, you're going to probably get some value out of this because there's 136 pages of stuff that you can either use as part of the Fading Embers campaign and, you know, adventure in this place called Nith, or you can just take pieces out and use it. Um, so I think it seems pretty fun and um, like I said you can click the link in the in the video description for Fading Embers Player's Manual and then also scroll down and check out these if you want to get all three of them. Uh, it'd be cool um, if you're watching Valiant Fox to consider maybe a bundle for all three at some point. I know it just came out so maybe you're waiting a little bit um, you know get those first sales and then do it later but eventually it'd be cool to have like a bundle to get all three because uh, I think a lot of people are going to want all three. So check it out under Fading Embers in those links below and give it a click. Next we've got Guild Zine, Societies for Explorers and Adventurers for Old School Essentials or OSR from the Tabletop Engineer, $10, 48 pages. And it says it's a new resource for OSR games. When adventurers aren't deep in the heart of some dun dangerous dungeon, they can be busy researching their next exploration using the incredible resources collected by various guilds dedicated to locating and mapping the lost tombs, crypts, and halls of structures lost to the ages. Guilds can offer their members unique resources, knowledge, and tools for their trips into the unknown. But are your players worthy enough for membership? Inside, GMs, referees will find unique guilds currently looking for new members and offering some amazing resources for a cut of the loot of course each guild has random charts and tables to roll on secrets for members to learn and keep special magical items and relics and that are only available to the guild members and more so that's fun and then here's some of the names the searchers guild the delver society obsidian pages so very cool let's take a look inside so you get to see eight of the 48 pages it says there are strength in numbers and no better example of this of this than in various guilds that players may encounter during their explorations of the world around them. Merchant guilds, thieves guilds, and wizardry guilds, for example, abound, but they are by their name limited to certain classes or careers. Not so with explorer and adventurer guilds. These guilds survive and flourish because they see not just strength in numbers, but also strength in the variety of skills their members bring to the table. By pooling weaponry, magic items, maps, books, and coins, a guild is able to not only increase the likelihood that its members will return home alive from a delve, but also with their pockets and bags heavy with loot. So, I'm recognizing that you need kind of a diverse group to adventure. And then it talks about the benefits that you get from being in a guild, and that's just the intro, and then each of the guilds with some really nice artwork. So this one's called the Searcher's Guild, and then you've got the Guild History, and then Membership, and then Guild Experts, like some of the people that you would meet in the Guild, and then here's some of the expeditions that you can do. So it says Tomb of Marganoush, Frequent Creatures, Shadow, Final Room Treasure, 45%, 5 Magic Items, 2 Scrolls, Guild provides uh, 1d4 Potions of Healing, 
And then just looking at the membership, it says temporary membership status is granted and remains in place until the new member has satisfied at least two of the following requirements. And then various things like six months of membership paid in full, um, a verified map of an assigned expedition by an explorer searcher and recovering of one or more magic items. So various rules, of course, all guilds would have rules. So it makes sense that they're here. And then they've got a history. I like how detailed these factions are. Um, very, very cool with even people here. And, and I know this says this for OSR, but you could easily adapt the factions to fifth edition. Yeah. You'd need the stats to be different, but I'm not seeing too much here that would really, I mean, even, even in all the pages I've seen here, you could, you could use this in fifth edition easily prices. You might have to take a look at cause pricing is different, but other than that, I don't know. I mean, maybe the, maybe the stats of these NPCs here, but it doesn't, the stats aren't, it's not a full stat block, right? It just says dwarf level one ranger, leather armor, sword, 3d8 plus 20 gold coins. I mean, that, that works. So fifth edition players, I would consider this as well. If you're looking for some adventuring guilds, um, factions, um, really looks nice. I like the artwork, like the concept, like, like everything I saw. So check it out under guild scene in the links below and give it a click. Next, we have Horror in Whitesonville by Jerry G um, and Terry Herc. It's $2.49 on sale, normally $4.99, 24 pages. This is a dark, deadly 5th edition horror adventure for 46 characters of the 5th level. Uh, it says, from the mind of game designer and voice actor Jerry G, discover the se dark secrets in the seemingly pleasant festival village of Weisenville. Visitors who have left the town have reported a slew of disappearances. Citizens complain of hauntings within their homes, and the local lord has even sent out a request to exorcise the malignant spirits from his mansion. Investigators should tread lightly, however, as they may discover not all of those in Weisenville are as friendly as they first appear characters can choose to unveil the truth about the missing villagers and the village's prosperity or simply hack and slash every obstacle until the village is at peace so yeah you've got two options there you can explore the village meet the villagers terrify your players with five new monsters ramp up tension with optional madness and it's got vtt maps so that's nice and you can see it looks very nicely laid out really cool fonts uh, easy to read looks like it's 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 definitely considering people's need for vtt which i like and uh yeah i like the the feeling of it it feels like it could be in ravenloft or just anywhere where you want to have a little bit of of um, stuff going on that's where there's disappearances and hauntings and stuff so that could be in, in really in any setting but ravenloft especially sounds good for it so unfortunately, the full preview was not working. So if you're listening, uh, Terry or Jerry, you might want to check, look into that. I know that happens with the site. Just maybe check it out. And it might be working, viewers, when you when you click the link. So you might check it there. But this this uh, quick preview, you can see quite a bit in it as well. You can read quite a bit of it. You've got adventure hooks. Here's the information on madness and the missing persons, as well as clues. Village games. And then here's a whole thing on the Haunted Manor, and you can see the map. And based on the description, it looks like you get VTT versions of these maps, which is super helpful. And then here's some village games, even. You could even take these games out and and uh, use them elsewhere, whether it's the Witchlight Carnival or just, just anywhere you need a game. That's really cool. And uh, I like this little it's a it's a pie that has a face on it but then there's a bite out of it or a piece cut out of it so that's that's a fun piece of art so yeah it looks like a fun time if you're looking for some disappearances in a village uh, for fifth level characters this is for you click on horror in Wisenville in the links below and check it out next we've got in the court of the frozen queen it's a module for second to fourth level characters venture into the cold north and unravel the mystery of the frozen queen but what's nice as you see it shows here fifth edition and 3.5 so that means you could play it with pathfinder you could play it with 3.5 you could play it with fifth edition so that's a lot of value so it says 
Something bad must have happened in the village of Fairhaven. The caravan that went there is missing, and no one from the village comes to the neighboring cities. Rangers report that an abandoned tower in the mountains is being rebuilt, and those who wandered close to the city tell the story of a frozen building in the middle of the city. Ice Queen arrived, bards say, cautiously telling the tale they overheard in Fairhaven, and the valley is going to freeze. So it's cool. We've had three modules this week where there's villages having various challenges, and I like it. Because again, as usual, when you watch the series, themes start to emerge each week, um, and you can stitch those together as a DM and have a campaign. So you could take the three modules we've shown this week already that have these towns having kind of horrible things going on and have your party go from village to village solving these problems. And uh, they all seem really fun and different, so it wouldn't be like the same thing over and over. It says a group of adventurers gathers in the Dragon Head Inn, worried about the things they heard. They do not know what they will find in the north, but they know one thing. To save the people of the valley, they must go and get an audience in the court of the Frozen Queen. So that sounds fun. Um, 25 new maps, 3 new monsters, and 2 magic items. And then there's a bundle where they you get uh, this, uh, this pdf plus the foundry vtt stuff so if you're if you're using foundry you might want to check out this bundle down here um, and get both but it's from dragon's horn studios let's take a look inside so you get to see seven of of the i'm not sure how many pages they don't have a page count listed you get to see seven pages but it looks like it's going up to 39 so at least 39 pages so you've got the prologue, and then here's the adventure. It's in, in uh, three acts, or four acts, because here's the Court of the Frozen Queen. And then uh, the epilogue as well. And then here's some information on the monsters and magical items for 5th edition. And then down here for 3.5, you got monsters as well as uh, some items. So that's nice that they're offering. I really like that they're offering both 5th and 3.5, because that's, that's also Pathfinder. Um, so very, very cool. So we'll read a little bit of this. That's cool artwork as well. And the, the missing caravan. Very cool. Yeah, I like that. Okay, let's take a look at the adventure hooks here. Missing caravan. Caravan bound to Fairhaven to pick up wild animal skins and meat did not return to the neighboring village. Players are asked to investigate as this is very unusual. So that's one option. Another option is Songs of the Bard. When resting in one of the taverns and villages near Fairhaven, the bard starts singing a new song, telling the tale of the so-called Ice Queen. So maybe they hear the song, and they want to go find out about the Ice Queen. And that's just two that they give you. And it could be easily adapted to any setting. Uh, it says it can be placed in any cold or mountain region. Um, so that's good. And then it says... They use these little logos here to signify whether it's a saving throw or check for 5th edition or 3.5. So that's really cool. Sometimes they say, oh, yeah, it's usable by these. But what they really mean is like the module is written for one edition of the game. And then you go to the back of the book and find out how to convert it. Or it's kind of slightly converted. But this book that we're looking at here is actually going through with it and converting it on the spot because you can see right here it says steps in the snow inspection of the roadside can uncover a fur hat laying in the snow a dc 13 wisdom perception check for fifth edition or for 3.5 it's a D dc 15 spot check so you see how they're using the color coding and the, and the symbols here to tell you which which one to use and that's really easy to read it stands out i like the colors and and the different icons they're using to to say hey this is fifth edition or this is uh 3.5 and it, it, that continues throughout so very good job here uh with that dragon's horn i think that's a great way to go and you could do a whole bunch of modules like this maybe they already have i don't know but um i think that's 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 really cool double the value so check it out under in the court of frozen of the frozen queen in the links below give it a click Next, we have It's Bigger on the Inside. Escape an arcane death trap in this adventure for sixth level by Beyond the Screen and Aviad Tal. 
it's it's uh, it says when the adventurers entered the manor of the old mayor, they did not expect to fall into another plane of existence. It seems Archmage Lenore was ready for their arrival and had arranged the finest entertainment for herself. Can the adventurers survive Lenore's death trap and capture the mad mage once and for all? This one shot adventure is designed for characters at sixth level and contains plenty of traps, encounters, and misdirection. And then it says the adventure includes a map for every encounter, including print and VTT versions. And look at this. It's really beautiful artwork. You can see even this table has all the setting with the, you know, it's got a turkey in the middle and, and just uh, the plates are occupied. Even the kitchen, you can see they've got like, it looks like a, a barrel of fish and uh, various things going on in the kitchen. So seems to be very lovingly created in, in terms of the maps. So let's go look at the inside. Okay, apparently your full size preview is not working, so check that out, Aviad, if you're if you're listening. Um, definitely want people to be able to see that. And uh, here's the credit page, and then you've got the the intro to the adventure with the synopsis set up, and then it looks like they've got a good amount of read aloud flavor text. That's helpful, and then it talks about all the maps and the order. It looks like the order that you would play them, and then. Uh, some sort of table here that we can't read the name of so you get to see a few of the 16 pages but so far it looks really good i like that there's all these maps um it says chasing the bounty on a murderous archmage the characters find themselves plunged into an arcane death trap their query has uh, was prepared for their arrival and has devised entertaining challenges in this magnificent mansion demiplane the characters will fight through various arcane hazards on their path to the inner sanctum of Archmage Lenore. As they get deeper and near the sanctum, the characters will meet the mage and her mother, possibly learn a little bit about the relationship between them, and a final showdown in the Archmage's sanctum, where the Orb of Reality is located. You can see kind of probably that's probably the Orb of Reality. Looks fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just for the maps alone, this could be, could be worth it because I, I like the look of these. But sounds like a fun adventure a demi plane uh, so this could be plopped into ravenloft could be plopped anywhere um it doesn't seem like you need a lot of space on your on your uh, map for a demi plane location to be because it's just a pinpoint and then you you go off into the demi plane so it could be easy to drop in and another investigative adventure we've seen a lot of investigative adventure this week so again you could you could have a campaign themed around your party being investigators which would be i think really fun so consider that by um looking at this and and the other adventures we've looked at this week so check it out under it's bigger on the inside down below in those links and give it a click next up we have jubelius's compendium of spooky things volume one and it's for fifth edition from wendigo workshop 483 is the price for 26 pages. Authors Jonathan Savigny and Matt uh, Roussel. I don't know how to pronounce those names. Sorry, guys, um, if I pronounced it wrong. Uh, it says 24 pages, yep, or 26 over here. Em embody a haunted toy animated by otherworldly forces. Have your eerie presence unnerve your foes and use your innate ability to cast magic at your advantage. That sounds fun. Explore the occult mysteries of alchemy and medicine with the Experimenter, a new intelligence-based class. Learn the secrets of necromancy through science and raise your own flesh golem, or become the monster as you harvest and sequence the blood of creatures to empower yourself. Use new items and dangerous monsters to, to surprise your players, giving them new challenges and loot. So that's cool. And it says, written with dyslexia-friendly font and interactive table of contents. So cool. Let's take a look inside got a fun little slime border here and then they said you know the the table of contents is hyperlinked so that's helpful you got the race the haunting dolls eldritch stuff the class so you've got the experimenter and then of course the subclasses equipment monsters all kinds of good stuff here's the intro and then the haunting dolls is a it looks like a race so that's fun read a little bit and then eldritch so let's go back up and read a little bit about the haunting dolls um it says whether it is in the dark corners of ravenloft or the countryside of the sword coast the weird and the occult are a part of everyday life in this section you'll find a dark and strange race that can join your adventurer's party 
Hunting dolls are animated objects often invested by occult forces. As they wander the world, their sole presence is often seen as bad omens. Others around them feel weary, as if the air around them is heavy, even cursed. Animated objects are a common sight, but haunting dolls are beyond simple objects. They have a mind of their own, living their life as any other living creatures. Haunting dolls are often created as followers to witches and warlocks. They help them while working, gathering ingredients, or doing simple tasks. They are born from chaos, esotericism, and tragedy. While some are summoned and created, others are forced to life by violent events where a spirit remains attached to a derelict doll so that's a really fun concept for a race um and then it's got you know the the names of the dolls which there's some cool obviously annabelle is one, one of those and then you've got the the traits um says you know one cantrip of your choice unnerving presence creatures attacking you or an adjacent ally for the first time have a disadvantage on their attack roll okay and then the sub races of possessed and eldritch so fun, fun, fun stuff. Um, I like the, the notion of these creepy dolls being a race that you can play. It works well with Ravenloft. And that's just a little bit of what we're seeing. There's there's a whole class in here that sounds really fun, the experimenter. And then you've got items and monsters. And it's only 483. So check it out under Jubilius's Compendium of Spooky Things in the links below and give it a click. Next we have Little Boy Lost. It says a monster stalks the city streets abducting women for its inhuman experiments sounds creepy uh by vrat vile knife and it's a dollar 99 for 31 pages and it says the adventures must stop the monster before it kills again it says it works best for two to four players of second to fourth level using the five torches deep core rules but it's compatible with fifth edition and fifth edition hardcore mode as well so the, it looks like the full-size preview is not working, so you might want to check that for it. Um, but we can see the quick preview. So you've got people, timeline, whoops, and then adventure hooks, scenes. And here's the guild hall. So let's read a little bit about the hooks. This party takes the bounty hunter job from Vignus to find Mara. Sheriff Firthheim hires the party as special deputies to find Mara. If the party solved other problems in Flusehaven, the mayor and town council send town guards to collect the party, insist that they hire on with the sheriff to find the missing woman. So several different ways there that you can get involved in finding finding the woman, and then you've got this whole timeline and all the people involved. So looks looks like it's it's got quite a bit of information for you. And uh, another adventure that's a little bit creepy, so it could work in Ravenloft or in your um pretty much any campaign i guess so check it out under little boy lost in the links below and give it a click next we've got plan our compass uh, number two and it's designed for old school osr basic beck me old school essentials you name it um so look at this beautiful art of these ships that's so cool it says, the second issue in our interplanar odyssey welcomes you to the deep end of the astral sea. Here there be strange sights, ever-changing environmental dangers and monsters, the likes of which you've never seen. And uh, it says it works with old school essentials, swords and sor or wizard wizardry, labyrinth lord, etc. And uh, 68 pages, uh, procedural hex generation for astral travel, a living dungeon, hellbent on your destruction, adventure hooks, magic items, and even a fishing game. And then you can buy the bundle, which has issue one and two for a different price down here. So be sure to consider that. Um, but it's $8 for, for this issue. Get to see 16 of the 70 pages. So we're seeing a little bit about hex flow here. And so this is how you would travel in the astral sea using um, hex flow, basically. So here's here's a cool map with like it shows you what's on each of these. I like these icons. <laughs> they look fun. It says large icon indicates that the encounter is nearby or the event is probable. The chance to evade is improbable. Small icon indicates that the encounter is farther away or the event is improbable. So that's cool. And then here's weather. They got tons of tons of art in here too. I really like this. So plane of fire, astral sea, plane of water. So it's showing you some nearby planes. 
and then the kinds of islands you'd find, psychic storm effect, potentially dangerous encounters, potentially benign encounters. That's nice. Yeah, lots of fun stuff in here. I mean, it's basically like Spelljammer stuff, which is awesome because, you know, they just released an Unearthed Arcana for some Spelljammer races, so it might be coming back. So if you play, you know, these older sets, uh, you might be able to experience some of this astral sea travel and get used to it before uh, potentially a 5th edition Spelljammer comes out. We don't know for sure if Spelljammer is coming back, but it could. So be cool to get, get, get a little bit of knowledge of it before it comes around. But uh, it says here, uh, let's, let's, let's read a little bit of it. For each hex flower, to determine what dominant condition, outcome, or important encounter will happen next, roll and sum the dice indicated for the hex flower. Consult the navigation hex and match the sum dice roll to one of the six arrow directions, the navigation directions. On the hex flower, move from the current hex to the next hex, hex in the direction indicated by the navigation direction. The next hex defines what is happening or about to happen. For simplicity in the hex flower shown opposite, the six navigation directions are superimposed over the center and colored red. So if the current hex is the center of the hex flower and the 12 is rolled, then the next outcome is set by the hex directly above the central hex. So some navigation to do, and it kind of shows you with it mapped out what I just read. So you can see, okay, if you're in the center, then you go this way, because this would be considered a hex flower, because it kind of looks like a overhead view of a flower. Um, very fun i i love the art tons of beautiful art in here so check it out under planar compass number two in the links below and give it a click next we have sandbox adventures fey plague of the underdark uh, for fifth edition from headless hydra press and shane collins 4.99 for 15 pages in the secret town of driftwood an eclectic mix of underdark denizens have lived peacefully until recently, when throngs of fey zombies have descended upon them. The residents believe they are coming from a strange and dangerous temple deep within a giant mushroom forest. Can the party uncover the temple's secrets and stop the fey plague from consuming driftwood? Interesting. So there, there's zombies, there's underdark, there's fey, all mixed together. I like that. Um, so it's a fifth level party uh, for the adventure. It's got two detailed... NPCs, VTT tokens, nine battle maps with grid and non-grid, random events tables, four new monsters, and 23 hex explorer map titles to create a region regional area hex crawl. So that's cool. And it can be dropped into any campaign with minimal prep. Look at this fun little mushroom map here. Got like a little mushroom forest. That looks fun. And then it says paper lantern map. And, uh, yeah, lots of really nice artwork. So you've got, you know, the mushroom forest. It says phosphorant mushrooms grow as tall as towers in this underground forest. The mushrooms, an invasive species imported from the fey by Nosifri, are the cause of the fey zombies. Vesser bowls carry the dead and dying to giant mushrooms where they meld into the mushrooms for a time. When the mushrooms release the bodies after a week or two, they are fey zombies. Many of the mushroom... Stocks contain half-formed fey, zombies, arms, grasping at anything that moves past the undead groaning for blood. So that's a very visual, very cool idea that, you know, you're walking by these mushroom, giant mushroom trees, basically, and there's arms and things poking out of them trying to get you. Um, so that could be very descriptive and fun for a DM to, to spring on, on their party. And then here's some information on random mushroom forest encounters. And uh, Driftwood, it says, paper lantern map. The location of Driftwood is closely held secret by its residents. If they are discovered, they would risk death or enslavement. One method they use to, to discreetly recruit new residents is through the use of paper lanterns that, when lit, reveal Driftwood's location. So that's also a fun little thing. You could you could say, you know, if you, here's this lantern in one of your other adventures, and then they have to kind of figure out to light it and then see that it's a map and then follow it. Um, so... All sorts of fun, inventive stuff going on in this adventure. I like that it can be dropped anywhere. I like that it's different and visual. Lots of artwork in here. So, very well done. Check it out under Sandbox Adventures 13 in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Seorces, 
um, Crafting Field Guide, or Sorsha, maybe? I think it's Sorsha. Sorsha's Crafting Field Guide by Knaves and Saves. And for those of you who bought Feywild Companion, Knaves and Saves, uh, John McLeod, the, the author of this, um, wrote the Glass Whale and the Green Seer from Feywild Companion for, for my book. So if you enjoyed those, you're going to gonna like this because John is a very talented writer. And uh, this looks like a lot of fun. I mean, just look at that cover. That is just stunning. And it's all kinds of crafting going on. So it's the Sorsha's Crafting Field Guide presents a rewarding pair of crafting systems and a fantastic generic set of crafting reagents for use in 5th edition. It provides GMs and players the power to expand crafting in their gaming world to vast limits. It is designed to be future-proof and will work with all 5th edition materials currently published and those that may be published later. It achieves this by introducing both herbs and creature parts with varying levels of strength, weak all the way to very strong. Provides two different crafting systems based on your risk tolerance for complications that can occur. Introduces multiple ways to acquire reagents, upgrades, kits, and tools into first-class citizens. Superior creature parts that require extra challenges to acquire. Buying, selling reagents. Simultaneous crafting projects. Developing your own craft recipes for any item and more. And this is 82 pages. So this is no joke. 82 pages about crafting. So... You can only imagine what is inside this book that you can use to get crafting off the ground. We've talked in previous videos, crafting is something players want. We see it in all these RPG games that we play, whether it's Warcraft or you know Diablo or any of these games, they have these crafting mechanics and, and players are always looking for that in Dungeons and Dragons. So it's nice when Knaves and Saves comes out with a book like this that fills that gap because you really don't see it in this stuff from Wizards of the Coast. They they touch on it with the you know the the kits and the artisan tools and things like that, but they don't really go in depth. So it's nice to have books like this that do. It says crafting recipes for every standard magic item. So you don't even have to to go make it up. It's in here. If there's a standard magic item, you just look it up and find the crafting recipe and you're good to go. Recipe creation rules for any 5th edition magic item you can dream up. Two crafting systems to choose from. That's nice. So if you don't like one, you have the other one. 100 new items, 56 unique herbs, some legendary potions, planner potions, crafting tool belt character sheet. So those of you that bought potions unlocked, here's some more potions for you. Um, and it says a percentage of all profits will be donated to the Worldwide Fund for Nature. So lots of reasons to buy this huge page count fills a need there's there's not much on crafting and you're going to get uh, a percentage of profits donated to a charity so plus you get this beautiful art to look at let's look inside so here's the the table of contents and you can see that they've got a lot of stuff so they've got the reagents with herbs Creature parts, crafting with the reagents, and then basic crafting, alternative system, complex crafting, penalties by level, simultaneous crafting projects, help from others, and then you've got new craftable items, all these potions and poisons and various things, and then you've got standard item craft re recipes, so some magic item that you saw in the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's probably a recipe in here for it, um, same with potions, and then how to create new recipes and then monsters i'm glad they they included this because once you kind of unleash this system on your on your your world people are going to say i now i want to create a recipe for something and so you're going to have to have a way to create it so it's nice that that's 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 here in chapter five and then just looking at the name so dream eater worm or foreland stinger vishar zornai dream slither so remember this author created the glass whale from Feywild Companion, which is a really fun creature. So if you like fun, inventive creatures, I'm sure these are just as good. Um, so here's here's the foreword. You get to see seven of the ADT pages here. And the information on the boundaries, some more fun art. That's really nice. I like that picture too. And it's perfect because it's showing them picking the, the materials for the crafting. Um, and then you've got the reagents. 
So let's look at some of these reagents. So it says collecting herbs. Collecting herbs requires a survival check, adding your proficiency modifier if you are proficient and an herbalism kit um, or with an herbalism kit. Whether this roll succeeds or not, roll on the mishap table to see if you run into any trouble. And then if the survival check was successful, you then roll 1d100 on one of the environment tables um, and determine which herb you find based on that roll. You find one herb and select one of its listed uses to record on your crafting sheet. And uh, so certain classes have increased benefits during the process of collecting herbs, so that would be druids and rangers. And then um, finding and collecting herbs is a time-consuming process and can only be attempted once per long rest. And then the mishaps that can happen include two dangerous enemies, one dangerous enemy, um, mo 1d4 moderately dangerous enemies, and 1d4 barely dangerous enemies. So um, you, could, you could run into some enemies trying to craft here. And then the herb types, you've got the toxin, medicine, drug, weapon enhancement, magic. And then here's some descriptions. We'll read one of these. So Crest Kiss, it says it's a weak drug, toxin weak. This is a re resilient shrub that tends to grow anywhere, including in inhospitable environments, being often found alongside rocky hills and valley valleys. It is sometimes seen in the cracks of cobblestone roads. Okay, very cool. Find that there. And then let's look at one of the others. Ashgrove Leaves. It's, it's weak magic and weak toxin. The ash grove is a pale tree often mistaken for a bush. Given its small size with hard bark found near volcanic activity, errant rangers often remark that when one emerges, it is an omen for rumblings beneath the ground or a potential volcanic event. Its leaves carry a distinct coating of ash that can be refined into a powder for future use. So lots of stuff to encounter in here, you know, looking for these things. Surely you've encountered players looking for crafting, wanting to get that going well it's all here in one book for you so check it out under sources crafting field guide in the link below links below and give it a click next we have spooky spider worshipers with this fun webbed cover by bendigen games it's a suggested price of zero on pay what you want and it's seven pages and it says to those who worship the queen spiders a poisonous reward awaits magic users like the spider sorcerer and the warlock of the spider pledge fealty to her and in exchange they can assume the form of their master or summon legions of arachnid defenders in times of need the greatest of which is the bizarre tentacle monster those with no arcane talent can still become faithful servants of the spider or in death killed by the poison sp uh, of the tiny spider demons of their queen they can become poisonous farting zombies. Okay, so there you go. You've got a farting zombie now. And uh, this is for 5th edition, of course. So you get to see four of the seven pages in the preview here. And so here's your spider sorcerer with the full stat block. And this is CR5. And then you've got the servant and the spider. And then here's your poisonous farting zombie which is the CR1 for one slash four. Um, and let's see what some of the actions are. Fumes or reactions. In response to being hit by a melee or ranged weapon attack, the zombie exudes an odorous and noisome vapor. Any creature other than a zombie within five feet of the zombie must succeed on a constitution saving throw or be poisoned until the start of the creature's next turn. On a successful save, the creature is immune to the stench of the zombie for one hour. Okay. So we've got a stinky zombie here and servant of the spider. Let's see what some of their abilities are. So they've got um, spider's devotion. The servant has advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. And then they've got some spells. So yeah, some fun little, little, little characters and creatures here. The spider sorcerer has a web ability. It's uh, the target is restrained by webbing as an action. The restrained target can make a strength check, bursting the webbing on a success. The webbing can also be attacked and destroyed. So fun. Yeah, lots of spidery stuff. Um, I know Halloween is over, but you can always use spiders, uh, whether you're dealing with the drow or the underdark or just anything that, that you, you need some spider stuff maybe you just need to fill a room in a dungeon so why not put some of these spider creatures in there a farting zombie um you know kids often find farting farting funny so you could if you're playing with kids you could use the farting zombie anybody finds farting funny usually so 
lots of people could enjoy that and it's it's suggested price of zero so you could could grab it for that you could also put in some money here or after you uh, purchase it decide to put in some money and uh, support the creator as well uh, by coming back to this page and filling this in later and then paying what you want as well so very cool uh, check it out under spooky spider worshipers in the links below and give it a click next we have sylvan stripe from adventure bundles it's a fifth level adventure with this they always have on adventure bundles this cool little grid that shows you how much of a mix of the different things so this one's mostly combat and then role play second with exploration third it says resolve the hostile sail made in the world in this uh, adventure 399 for 23 pages fifth edition of course uh, Dorwell Plains used to be a desolate place. The soil was barren, a dry desert that was avoided by most creatures. Ironically, it was undead creatures that started the cycle of life. During the Lich War, uh, where thousands of, or Lich War, I should say, where thousands of soldiers fell, it was their blood and flesh that fertilized the ground. Small plants grew into a now lush and thick forest, a mystical place that is now avoided not because of its void, but because of all the life, the beasts, undead, fey, and outcasts that chose this forest as their new home. Some 300 years ago, the forest got even more reputation as it was revealed that specific plants, mushrooms, and bushes hold magical properties that, uh, properties that the same plants in other forests don't have. This has led to strife between local protectors and researcher wizards who want to exploit the area for its properties. So that's fun. I, you know, you've got these plants that are behaving differently. So people are trying to, to get a hold of them. And, you know, we looked at that crafting supplement uh, a couple uh, minutes ago, and that could work with this as well. Cause you know, you got to find plants and various things. So it's lots of synergies every week. I see it. So DMs watching the whole episode can, can join these things together and make a one of a kind campaign. Uh, it says this is the seventh adventure. Yep, and uh, four homebrew items on pr that can be printable item cards. So yeah, th they've released seven so far, and they they always have this cool little icon on the front and very cool interior art. So let's take a look at that now. So you get to see the whole adventure as well. Another good reason to take a look at this. Got the wizard style layout. So here's the information on the forest and locations. So this is a beautiful map. I really love the artwork here. And then you've got your, your flavor text. We'll come back and read some of that. But just let's just scroll through the whole thing so you can see lots of stat blocks. And then magic items. These are fun. Potion of Extreme Perspiration, Bird's Eye Staff. The bird's eye staff looks really cool. I like that art. And I like this this uh, Cloak of Seasons. Yeah, they've got some really good artists involved always in their stuff. So let's go back to the um, information right here. I want to read this little read aloud. It says, The wind blows softly over the leaves of the nearby bushes and chills your skin as it passes by. A patch of mossy earth and leaves moves slightly like a small tornado. And within the thick foliage appear four creatures. They have feminine form, green skin, and leaves hang from their bodies. One is much larger and walks ahead of the rest with a dominant posture. She also has wooden hair that protrudes from her head like antlers. She speaks as you notice her. Adventurers running through the forest, cutting off bushes to light fires. Explain yourselves. So the dryad in the front is Sidonia, the queen of the creatures in this part of the forest. Depending on which adventure hook you pick, there are two scenarios to play, and then it goes through those. And yet, Sidonia, there's a whole section on Sidonia here, and then something about an unseen war. So I think there's a lot to offer in here. I mean, even if you just grabbed it for the, the items, I mean, those items look a lot of fun. It's only $3.99. So check it out under Sylvan Strife in the links below and give it a click. Next, we've got Terrors, Treasures, Tyrants, and Towns. The Expanded Compendium, featuring monstrous modules from Dan's Dungeon, or Dan's Dungeons, and uh, Daniel James is the author, and you can get the PDF for $24.99 or a hardcover for $29.99, or the same price, get the hardcover and the, the PDF, so that's a really good deal. And it's 200 pages, 
So you can see here it's got five town maps, five dungeon maps, 30 monster tokens for VTT, and those look stunning. And then we'll read a little bit of that that here so it says the tone that lies before you is a compendium of terrors treasures tyrants and towns at its core these creations are made to give gms a horde of unique and terrifying materials to easily throw into their campaigns on the fly it's designed to inspire and stoke the imagination and most importantly enjoyable to use so there's four sections you've got the 25 twisted terrors be it random encounters while traversing the world a monster to terrorize towns or the servants of a greater evil these creatures are designed to fill the dark and deadly corners of your campaign 25 tantalizing treasures, wondrously crafted items to fill the treasure chests of your dungeon, be wielded by powerful foes, or hint towards the origin of your world. 5 tyrannical tyrants. These select monsters are a bane to the world. They are purveyors of death and misery. Those selfish desires are only matched by the fear they inspire. Either as standalone baddies or the big one itself, their deadly ways will challenge any party to its core. And then you've got five terrorized towns with everything needed to kickstart a story or fill the gap between them. These towns are meant to make your prep day that bit smoother or give you something to throw at the party at a moment's notice, either incredibly malleable or with histories that link to the terrors and tyrants. They provide a useful cap to everything within this tome. And then you've got 200 pages, of course, modules spread across levels 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. And uh, yeah, looks like a lot of fun. Let's look inside. This one has a publisher preview, so it's going to look a little different. Um, basically, the publisher uh, uploads their own PDF that they want to use just for the preview. So we've got, it looks like uh, I'm going to bounce around here and see some different monsters. Yeah, so look, here's the luminal with a picture of, of it. it looks like kind of like a firefly and it talks about um, the essence of light hissing fire and then you've got the coral ring that looks really cool i love the art and the creeping stick hunter's bow and hide so 21 different pages to see look at this beautiful map of the ridgefall home and then the module progression map so this looks really fun i think this is a good good uh time to just flip through it enjoy looking at the art um, and we're, we're seeing a mixture of pages from throughout we're not seeing continuous pages here because it's a publisher preview but but it, it's giving you an idea of the cool art that's going to be inside so that's that's the key point here so let's read about the coral ring it says coral has long held a wondrous and revered place in many societies scholars and druids arguing over its perplexing and beneficial properties is it a plant or a living being is it some form of aberration or a creation of the gods nobility and jewelers have also constantly sought it in quantity searching for new and amazing ways to combine the colorfully twisting pieces with jewelry or clothing at arcane universities that are found near the coastlands of the realm the coral ring is a relatively popular magical item for transmutation apprentices to craft during the years of learning the ring showcasing the ability to imbue life into a corporeal object so and then it's uncommon and it's got these traits uh can't really read that but it looks like it's got something called living breath and symb symbiotic home it says once per day the ring can be splashed with salt water to restore five hit points the small pieces of coral feeding upon the water and reciprocating the, the sharing of life with the wearer and then yeah i can't read that but there's something called living breath so that's cool but yeah i'm loving all the artwork this this fun devil of the depths creature just just fun fun stuff um, to, to be had here. So look for Tears, Treasures, Tyrants, and Towns in the links below and give it a click. Next, we've got Trade Winds, an Items and Services Compendium from David McLeese um, and Faulty Wire Games. And you can get uh, the PDF for $14.99 or the full color uh, premium book uh, hardcover for $49.99 or both for $49.99. It's 170 pages. It says it's for 5th edition or system neutral. It says if you know where to look, you can find anything in a city. Trade winds don't, don't just bring the weather with them. They also bring unimaginable wealth and utter ruin. The focus of this book is on non-magical gear, equipment, and services. It also features a monetary system that values all coin denominations, not just gold. There are a few more fantastical things presented here uh, for those that are brave enough to utilize them cool so let's look inside i like the cover quite a bit so they've got 
starting wealth, their monetary system, weapons, ammunition, burden, items and equipment, trinkets, clothing, potions, lifestyle, animals, paid travel, vehicles, trade goods. So it's really going to fill in a lot of gaps for um, maybe things that people want, but there aren't a lot of details on. I mean, even just vehicles alone, there's not, not that much on. Um, so the money money system rolling for prices availability of items selling items the coins shows you different because this covers other types of coins that you can use not just the standard gold pieces as well starting well starting gear and then here's all about the weapons you can see all the different ones with labels on them and then descriptions so you get to see 17 of the 170 pages so get to see basically a, a big chunk of the weapon section which is nice so we'll come up here and read uh, a little bit about the coins you will notice in this book that the descriptions of coins are presented differently than are in most role-playing systems in many other systems items only cost gold and the value of other coins are neglected gold coins and other game systems are more common than copper inflation leaves gold feeling more like lead when it should feel like the currency of kings trade winds addresses the inflation problem by placing more value in the lower coin denominations and by introducing additional coins this ensures that coins are made that made of gold continue to feel like gold and that other coins don't become neglected coins have a monetary value and they are made of metals that have market value this book assumes the market and monetary values of these metals do not fluctuate so and then you go into the print pence uh, crown pound shilling all those things um, so anybody who's a numismatist or into coin collecting is going to probably really appreciate this um, as well but I think it's got a lot more to offer than that because there's so many pieces of non-magical uh, equipment in here that you can look at um, you know so you've got the dart and it goes the dart is a long needle shaped object with a flight at the end these are designed to be used in conjunction with a blowgun or they may be thrown for one point of damage the dart can be used as a poison delivery vessel and some taverns darts are thrown against a cork board as a form of recreation so you can use that even if you don't want to switch out your currency to the the ones recommended in this book so lots of stuff in here i think you should check it out if you're looking to populate a city uh, with items get people shopping for whatever reason i think i think that would you know you're always going to have a need somebody's going to need to go buy something for a quest and they're going to want to do some other shopping so check it out under trade trade wins in the links below and give it a click next we have trial by fire it says the characters are sent on a delivery errand that puts them in a chance encounter with a dangerous undead drake by torchlight press and it's 3.99 for 14 pages and the author also includes Addison Short. It's for three to seven characters, optimized for a party of four characters of force first level. The Postal Guild received a package destined for an abandoned Dwarven Tower. Oddly, instructions for the delivery request the adventurers by name. So, mm, okay. And it's got a fully illustrated map. There are watchtowers, beacons of light throughout the under earth around the Dwarven city of Eth Older. They offer a reprieve from the dangers that lurk in the dark and provide an emergency call system for the disparate towns and villages that have grown in the winding caves. Sometimes as populations shift, these watchtowers fall out of use. One such tower is now inhabited by a drow oracle. So it talks about the drow oracle here. I won't spoil it, but let's look at the publisher preview. So looks Looks very well made as usual from Torchlight. Information on running the adventure. And they got the background and the characters and you've got uh, the read aloud text. And oh, that's a cool looking map for these under under towers. Even, even got the isometric view of it. Very cool. And then all the locations, you get to see 14 pages. And you get the, the, the Drake is back here that you have to deal with. So let's go back up and read some of that flavor text. It says, The adventure begins in the streets of Eth Alder, where the characters are intercepted by a member of the Postal Guild. A young dwarven lad wearing blood orange overalls and a white button-up shirt approaches in a rush. The young man is disheveled, and out of breath, his shirt is stained with sweat, and the cuffs of his pants are coated in dirt. It says, The, the dwarf's name is Breswell. 
bronze beard. He's a new apprentice at the Postal Guild and a bit of a mess. His superiors sent him to scour the city for the characters because a package in their care is meant to be delivered by them. Not expecting the man to actually find anybody, Braswell can explain the following to the characters and that lists all that. I don't want to spoil it, but it looks fun. I mean, mysteriously, the, the characters are mentioned by name on this, right? So what is going on? Why are they named in this? And what are they going to have to explore? It looks like they're going to have to explore this really fun tower i like this notion that these towers are, are used to to watch over things and sometimes they get abandoned and occupied by somebody else so i think this could be really unique setting for an adventure and of course the art is nice and the layout is nice easy to read so check it out under trial by fire in the links below and give it a click next we have wondrous weavings warped and weird um which is designed for old school essentials, but other OSR games can use it. And it's by Axie and Spice, and it's $1.49 on pay what you want. So uh, that's that's very nice. Author Giuseppe Rotondo. And it's an alternate arcane magic system for old school essentials, and it's compatible with similar clones of Beck Me, Basic, all that stuff. It's in inspired by how magic works in the stories of Jack Vance and Fritz Lieber. More than a little inspiration comes from fairy tales and folklore as well. These rules apply to both the magic user and elf class. The referee may, of course, decide to extend to other classes. The overall result of these rules is that arcane casters are somewhat more versatile and powerful at the beginning and a bit less almighty at upper levels. The larger impact on the game, however, comes with the introduction of magical mishaps, which give spellcasters the option to increase efficiency and power if they accept a certain degree of risk. That's interesting. So we'll see how that shakes out in the in the preview here. I'm not sure how many pages it is. It doesn't have a page listing. Um, but we get to see eight pages here. And uh, so you've got the introduction, then spell casting, spell books, and then optional rule ritual casting, magical mishaps. So we're getting to see a lot of stuff, lots of mishaps, which is nice. You can always use those, even even in fifth edition, probably could use some of those. So let's let's find something to read here. Uh, let's see. I think the magical mishap table is going to be probably the most fun to check out. Uh, so you've got the target transforms into another being as a as per the polymorph spell, but ignoring the hit dice limitations, and then it has a list from bat to red dragon. Um, let's scroll down here. So, what else? Uh, it says a complete banquet table with dis delicious food for 10 people appears in front of the target. Double chance of wandering monsters who have been attracted by the scent. Uh, the spell is cast normally, but another random spell from the caster's mind is cast along with it. The caster may decide the target of the second spell. Uh, the target shifts forward in time. They disappear and reappear after 1d4 plus 1 rounds. So all kinds of magical mishaps. These could be used as wild surges. Um, they could be used as wild effects. Uh, if you, you know, are playing anything that uses a wild effect, you know, the, the Feybound lineage and Feywild Companion, for example, has wild effects, so you could use those there. Um, all kinds of uses for magical mishaps. I mean, anytime you have magic, there's a chance it could go wrong. You know, if you just want to spice it up, things are getting a little boring, just roll on this table and throw it in there. Um, as long as there's a spell involved, because a lot of these reference the caster. You might have to roll a couple times if there's no, no spell casting going on. Um, yeah, it looks really fun. A lot of options. I like, I like the artwork and the layout here. It looks really easy to read. I'm not seeing typos. Uh, well organized so good job Axie and Spice I like this I think it'll be fun for people so check it out under wondrous weavings warped and weird in the links below and give it a click well that's our last drive through RPG title for this week before we move on to DMs Guild please subscribe to the channel click that like button leave us a comment we will respond to those share the video out there so we can get the word out about all these creators be sure to click those links and purchase these titles that we're showing and if you click those links and purchase anything uh, we get a small percentage which helps support the channel and if you're feeling especially generous 
consider purchasing one of our books. We just released Fizzband's Vault of Draconic Secrets, which is like the perfect player's companion to the the Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons that came out from from Wizards. Or you can use it on its own. Got lots of fun dragon themed player stuff in it, and it's an Electrum bestseller, so it's a lot of people are enjoying it. We've also got Feywild Companion, 150 pages of Feywild fun for players and DMs with two complete adventures, monsters, subclasses, spells, items, backgrounds, so much stuff. I can't even say. Check it out. It's linked in the description below. It's our, all of our books, like Potions Unlocked, Van Richten's Libra of Lineages. Check those out. They're a lot of fun. Getting great reviews on all of them. They're all bestsellers, so I want you to enjoy them as well if you haven't checked them out already. So please do that. And now let's go on to DM Skilled. Our first DM Skilled title is OC Tober 2021 Monster Manual, 31 Creatures to Bolster Any Game by Joseph Andrews. And you can see a lot of the creatures, creatures here on the front cover. Um, and it's a suggested price of $0 on pay what you want, 34 pages. And the author says, this is the result of a challenge I gave myself. It was a version of Inktober that I made my own. I call it OC Tober, meaning original content in this case where the author created 31 different monsters throughout the month of October including not just the information on the on the monster but the artwork so that's where you see all this fun little characters here so if we look at the quick preview here uh, you can see the skeletal ooze and the gourd slug so these definitely were inspired I'm guessing by October You've got carnivorous gourd slug and then an awakened corpse slug lots of slugs angled gentleman Juan Yudo. so you get to see seven of the 34 pages here in this quick preview but they look fun i like that each one has art uh various characters going on here we're not seeing all the ones on the cover so there's there's a spider in there somewhere there's some sort of carnivorous plant this kitty doing some stuff so lots of fun options. I think it's cool when people take on these challenges. Last week we had one of the Sword Timber ones. This is OC Tober that this person invented. Um, challenges are good to help motivate people to create. So I, I'm always excited to see people actually execute on that. In this case, Joseph managed to complete one for each day. That's an accomplishment. So check it out if you're in the market for some new monsters under 31 days. OC Tober in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Ace's Archive of Oddities 30 new 5th edition items by Xander Coulson or Alexander Coulson. Uh, 250 for nine pages. It says, From firearms imbued with the heart of the storm to dark life stealing blades, this tome of items has a plethora of different options. It's it's got three new weapon types: the shuriken, the chakram, and the all-new firearm, the tempest. Evolving items that grow along your alongside your PCs. And it says this group of items has something for everyone. With knowledge collected by Ace Cosmos, this collection of goodies is sure to impress. Let's look inside. So this one uh, has a quick preview here, so you can see uncommon items. Something called the bracelet of eternal love. And the Glove of Deterioration, I believe that's what it says, with a cool-looking angel here. And you've got rare items. And you're just getting to see these these couple pages out of the out of the nine. But those sound like some fun names for the for the items. So it'd be nice, Alexander, if you're watching, if you could maybe put one in here where we can read the full text or add a full preview. I know full previews are a challenge to get to work right on this site. So you may have tried to do that and it just didn't work. But I think adding one in here, just, just so people can see a taste of your writing, because it looks like the art is nice. Um, and I think that people would be interested because I, I like the names of these. Bracelet of Eternal Love sounds like a, a cool sounding uh item was a backstory that you could come up with pretty easily and you've got spectacles in here all kinds of stuff so uh give it a, a a try and and a lot of times these suggestions i make the the authors do it before you guys even click the link so if you're watching this give it a click anyway and check it out and see what else maybe alexander's added or go ahead and give it a try it's only 250 so it's it's not that much to to give it a try anyway Check it out under Ace's Archive of Oddities in the links below. Next, we have Baron of Bloods Codex Vampirica or Vampirica. 
I don't know, Vampirica? I don't know. I'm butchering it. You get the idea. It's right there. <laughs> it says, Become a creature of the night in the supplement. Um, the Baron of Blood, Artor Morlin, has long been a historian of vampiric lore, artifacts, and beasts. He boasts grand libraries in his lair beneath the streets of Waterdeep and has recently decided to unlock the vault. In his generosity, he has compiled his collected knowledge into this book. He now offers it to you. Within you will find a trove of new rules options for all character classes, as well as a custom class for anybody wishing to play history's most famous bloodsuckers. So um, there's all kinds of stuff you're seeing here in the table of contents. You've got what is a vampire, and then kind of lore and history and half-bloods. Then you've got all these vampiric houses, such as the House of Flesh, the House of Shadows, the House of Blood. Then you've got courts and how to create a vampiric court, which is really cool. Um, Feywild has a, uh, the Feywild companion book I wrote has um, a court guard subclass in it that could benefit from, from this, because uh, one of the options is to have that court guard subclass come from a vampiric court, so you could use uh, Feywild companion with this book. Um, and then you've got vampiric character options with the races, including their version of a dampier and then a vampire race template. You've got the class of a vampire and then subclasses, everything from mist prowler for ranger, domain of undeath for cleric. So all sorts of ways to work in that vampire into the subclasses, plus the power of blood with sanguimancy spells, magic items, artifacts, even a bestiary vampire template. So Anything and everything related to vampires appears to be in here, and it's 116 pages for $9.99 by Matthew Baker. Let's look inside. Some fun artwork. You can see kind of a summary table here of the subclasses. So it says, for the Domain of Undeath, it opposes the powers of life and death. And then uh, let's look at uh, one of the other one, the Ranger, the Mist Prowler, frightens and tracks prey through misty lands. So those are some fun descriptions. And then you get to see nine of the 116 pages. So we're getting to see quite a bit of the subclasses. You're getting to see the Barbarian, Path of Savagery, Bard, College of Vitae, uh, all kinds of stuff in here, including that cleric domain we've been talking about in the Druid Circle of Blood, Fighter Maleficar. So let's look at the... Um, Let's look at the domain of undeath here. Gods of undeath preserve strange facsimiles of life in an effort to deny the gods of life and death their cycle. The afterlife is a peculiar notion to these deities. When life has so much to offer, why die? Gods of undeath include entities like Shar, Kion Shirley, Velsharun, and Orcus. There is energy in death, and that energy can be utilized to prolong life or subvert it altogether. The goal is to escape from the shackles of mortality and become something altogether different. Followers of these gods of undeath are vampires that seek to usurp the cycle of mortality and achieve a different planar existence of being, as well as bring undeath to others. Clerics of undeath fiercely oppose clerics of the grave and clerics of life. These enemy clerics' insistence on preserving life and death are foolish notions that ought to be discarded. So you get kind of an anti-cleric here, which is fun, and it fits the vampire theme. And you've got vampiric na nature here uh, with some different abilities like shape changer. So looks like a lot of fun vampire stuff. This can work for Ravenloft or, you know, vampires can exist pretty much in any setting. Um, you know, any of the official settings, that is. So definitely always going to have a need for vampire stuff so why not check it out in the links under baron of bloods codex vampirica and give it a click next we have the blade master by M micah Muldowney. it's a fighter archetype and it says having dedicated themselves to the mastery of swordsmanship blade masters are swift and fell handed in a melee particularly in single combat where their knowledge of blade form and tactics make them a match for even the most dangerous of foes as long as they hold a sword in their grasp a blade master can control the flow of battle and flip circumstances in their favor so sounds like a fun one it's five pages and you get to see all five so very good reason to come take a look at this and see if it's going to work for you uh i i like the artwork we have in here it's uh it's fun 
and it's a nice little layout with this uh, kind of parchment background too. So you've got the sword forms. It says sword forms are practice blade patterns and choreographies comprise the foundation of the blade master's art. They cannot be used with other weapons. At the third level, you learn three sword forms and you learn two additional forms of your choice at 7th, 10th, and 15th. Each time you learn new sword forms, you can also replace one form you know with a different one. You may activate a sword form at any time as a bonus action. Until you use a bonus action to to change the sword form or dismiss it, the benefits and limitations of the sword form applies. So bore on the scree. Attack and damage rolls gain plus two if you move at least 10 feet before attacking. In Bonetti's defense, other creatures roll attacks against you at disadvantage as long as you are on difficult terrain. And then there's other, other ones as well. But it's fun giving you kind of different names for these forms of your sword so you can kind of mix it up and um, you know have have a name that you can even say I'm gonna try this form I'm gonna do this you know gives you kind of some fighter speak to use which can make make the role play part of it a little more fun and I always love abilities and in, in subclasses where it's like pick one of all these things because then you can really make each blade master different and you can also change it based on the needs of the campaign and you're not kind of stuck with a feature that you're not going to use because it just doesn't fit it, it's it's a lot more flexible so i always like seeing that in subclasses so why don't you come see it and check it out in this full-size preview uh, which shows the whole book by looking for blade master in the links below and give it a click Next, we have Bloodied and Bruised Monster Manual by Ann Gregerson. It's already a best silver seller, and it's only been out a few days, uh, so that means it's sold over 100 copies already. It's got a great price at $4.95 for only 88 pages. It says new combat actions for the creatures in the Monster Manual. The bugbear chief nurses a gushing wound in her side before issuing an order of retreat to her allies. A bright light forms around the angel's dying body, blinding everyone near it as it passes on from the world of the living. With blood streaming down its torso, an enraged hill giant slams its fist into the ground and causes the earth around it to quake. Blooded and Bruised is a series providing new combat actions for the creatures in the 5th edition roster. When pushed to their limits in combat, these monsters, critters, fiends, and foes gain new abilities that aid them in battle, or perhaps spell their doom depending on the circumstances. Bloodied and Bruised takes inspiration from the Bloodied Condition from 4th edition, making entirely new combat actions that completely change the nature of a fight. In addition, Bloodied and Bruised also introduces several death throws to the game, marking the demise of certain creatures with a grand explosion, heavy fall, or other unique effect to make the slaying of a great monster a truly unique experience. And then, thankfully, Anne lists here some examples of the bloody action. So we've got Iron Golem here. So since this particular issue of the Bloodied and Bruised series focuses on the monster manual, what you're going to see is all the monsters are listed from the monster manual so if you have that book you can basically look up a monster in here from it and find out what the bloodied actions would be when it gets to you know 50 percent health or whatever criteria so in this case it says the iron go golem when bloodied at 105 hit points the iron golem has the following features and then these are basically new actions or traits that you would have in the stat block for the Iron Golem at that point that aren't there prior to that. So if the Iron Golem has more than 105 hit points, it's not gonna have all these fun different abilities. And what's nice about this is that if you're playing D&D a lot, you're gonna start to know, even if your character doesn't know what an Iron Golem does, you know. And so this gives the DM some options to mix it up and and uh, kind of surprise you. And even if you don't want to use these these actions and traits as bloodied actions or traits, you can use them just to add flavor to a totally different monster. There's nothing stopping you. That's the beauty of this game is that you can change it to however you want. So let's just look at a couple here. It says ability recharge poison breath. When first bloodied, the golem's poison breath ability is recharged. So it automatically recharges. And then it's got frailty malfunction. While bloodied, the golem doesn't work as optimally. Its speed is lowered by five feet to a minimum of 10 feet and it cannot take reactions. So some of these are even negative to the uh, creature. And then next we have new ability overheating. 
While bloodied, the golem overheats to maintain efficiency. Any creature who touches the golem or hits it with a melee attack while within five feet of it takes five fire damage. If a gallon or more water is dumped on the golem, this trade is suppressed until the end of the golem's next turn. So I like that, that there's even a way to maybe turn this ability off by dumping water on it. So those are things that your, your characters might try, they might learn along the way. Um, so that's that's really good. And then um, you've got here Hill Giant. Uh, it says one bloodied at 52 HP. The Hill Giant has the following features. So the, the HP is different, right? Because each of these monsters is gonna have a different starting hit point range. And you don't wanna have everybody going off at the same hit point level because for for one creature that might be half another it might be 25 percent right so they, they've got to change it a little bit and and so Anne has done that here so you can see that the hill giant isn't going to become bloodied until 52 so if you think of it in like relation to the cr you know a cr1 is going to become bloodied faster than maybe a cr10 because it's got less hit points it's going to maybe be beaten more quickly it's not as strong so you know it might it might get there faster in terms of the number of hit points but let's look inside and it's got this very bloody looking <laughs> layout which is appropriate right this whole thing's called bloodied and bruised right um so we'll read a little bit about the bloodied condition in a minute but and then here's the death rows that they're talking about with the with the uh creature entries and stuff so um you've got all the different uh types of creatures here you got the era crocra the aboleth the angels planetar all that stuff ankeg ezer all these things basilisk be here bullet on and on they're alphabetically like if you have the monster manual you can literally go through this and find everything um in line with it that's why it's 88 pages is there's so many different monsters in the monster manual that um you're gonna need this so let's go back up and, and read a little bit about the bloodied condition. Originally from 4th edition, it is used to signify how a creature is faring in a combat scenario. Creature becomes bloody when it reaches half its hit point maximum. So that's why we were seeing the different numbers, which acts as a way of communicating the state of, of an opponent in a fight. Telling the players that the creature they are fighting is bloodied shows them how far along in the fight they are and whether they should be planning a retreat or going in for the kill. For consistency's sake, all creatures in this document are given the bloody condition, even where that word may not be the most suitable to use. In some cases, such as with constructs and oozes, the terms bruised or battered better describe how creatures faring in the fight. So that's nice that they're thinking through that. And then some creatures gain new abilities. We've seen that. And then uh, down here, you've got death rows. It's a new effect meant to make the defeat of an enemy stand out as it makes its final show of defiance when slain. So fun stuff, lots of lots of creatures in here that you can read. I mean, you get to see 20 of the 88 pages. So that's a significant amount uh, you're able to read. So I think this price point is great. I think this concept is great. I know it was a popular feature of fourth edition, even though I didn't play fourth edition, I've heard about it. So I'm happy that Anne is bringing this back and that people are getting a chance to, to try it out. And you know, that's, a significant number of monsters that Anne has mapped out for you and you know Anne has several series of books um, we've profiled them some of them on here before including the loot series that Anne does so I'm guessing that there will be more bloodied and bruised titles in the future so why not check out the first one by looking for bloodied and bruised in the links below and give it a click next we have champions of darkness by Nicholas Totieff and Marco Bertini, plunge the world into darkness with 12 new subclasses and artifacts. So it's 4.95 for 23 pages. It says the old, old world is dead, the new world is struggling to be born. Now is the time of monsters, and to defeat a monster, you have to become one. The subclasses described in this book are vile, hateful, and sinister, but those are just tools for the job. Tame demons lead an unholy crusade, summon the march of the dead to your side, and more. In this twisted book made for true monsters, become champions of darkness. So you've got 12 subclasses and 12 legendary items designed specifically for each of these subclasses. So you've got uh, Barbarian Path of Runic Scars, Bard College of Demon Masters, Cleric Domain of the Sacrificial Lamb, Druid Circle of Insects, Fighter Eternal Armor, 
Monk Way of the Harrowing Dancer, etc. So lots of them here. And it's also got um, these 12 legendary items and a new demonic servant with a stat block. Versatile options for each class. So you've got all these different pieces here. So you've got the paladin. And then here's the legendary item. So we're going to read some of this in a second. So here it shows you all the, the um, subclasses followed by all the artifacts. So let's let's go down and, and read a little bit of the Paladin. It says, Oath of the Unholy Crusade. Following the Oath of the Unholy Crusade, you stand as a sworn enemy of good in all its forms. You wish to erase all forms of charity and benevolence from the face of the earth, transforming altruism into selfishness, generosity into avarice, and kindness into wickedness. Sometimes called cursed knights, the Paladins who take this oath stand alongside the darkness in the fight against the light. You might have demonic traits such as horns, tails, or fire red pupils, and you love to decorate your weapons and armor with the trophies of your victims. So yeah, that is pretty dark, <laughs> but that's the goal, right? Um, it says, Tenets of the Unholy Crusade, and, and they've got Feeding the Darkness, Preserve the Crusade, No Mercy for the Weak. And then the third level ability, it says, At third level, when you take this oath, part of your appearance changes to represent the evil that dwells within you. The higher your strength score is, the more prevalent the physical change is. You may grow twisted horns, a barbed tail, eyes in random places on your body, or anything else that you feel is appropriate to your oath. These changes do not affect your abilities or your stats in any way. When you make a charisma check, you also add your strength modifier to the result. Additionally, you can choose to deal necrotic damage with your Divine Smite instead of Radiant. So it's tweaking some things, giving you a ribbon with your you know, appearance here adding some some modifiers to some stuff so all around pretty good now let's look at the uh legendary item um so you've got claws of the raven this weapon is bag knock a claw-like weapon that fits over the knuckles of the hand you gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon in addition the weapon ignores resistances to slashing damage when you deal sneak attack damage with this weapon as a bonus action you can make an extra attack on a hit the extra attack deals half damage but also does half sneak attack damage if the target is eligible for a sneak attack so and it says requires attunement by a rogue so this would presumably go with a rogue uh, subclass very cool so let's take a look at the interior so you get to see seven of the 23 pages we're not going to read anything from here because we've already read a little bit but i wanted to at least scroll through so you can see you know you got the bard college of demon masters and it's got a even a demonic servant that works with it um so yeah you can read quite a bit about these subclasses between this and the previews on the page itself but i think it looks fun You've got a lot of different dark subclasses, whether it's for Ravenloft or just you want to bring some darkness. You know, keep in mind with subclasses, if you're a DM, there's nothing stopping you from having an NPC have some of the abilities. So I know it seems like a player supplement, but there's always options for NPCs when you have subclasses. So DMs don't ignore subclasses i think they're a great way to really just tweak even if you just give one feature to an npc it can really tweak and make things different especially homebrew ones because a lot of players do buy these books but they don't buy every single one out there right so you're gonna find some that they just haven't heard of so check it out under champions of darkness in the links below and give it a click next we have creepy monster compendium a gathering of theoretical monsters, creatures, beasts, and more. From a whole bunch of people, I'll read a few of the names. Alan Johnston, Blynn Emerson, Chris Nakamura, Col Colette Quatch, David Mar Markisqui, not sure, D.W. Dagon, Jesse Jordan, and more. Uh, it says, Creepy Monster Compendium is a book of 28 original monsters for 5th edition. These creatures are setting neutral, ranging from CR 1 slash 4 to 16 all ready to appear at your table with stat blocks and accompanying lore to your standard horror monster to the unimaginable eldritch beings there are all types of creatures to haunt your players with and we've got a list of the people involved we've got a lot of creepy stuff this week and maybe just left over from halloween feelings but i like it it's helpful for ravenloft it's helpful for just general creepiness i mean this 
really bizarre looking banner snatch could be used in any campaign um although it's probably especially appropriate with body horror campaigns i i think it'd be fun to see and same with straw man here you can have a straw man in a lot of campaigns kind of a creepy scarecrow style uh, creature so this says here on the banner snatch this entity is a folk tale of esoteric ritual practitioners practitioners and literary researchers alike it's only fabled description being a horse tree of limbs magical to the take to the taking this creature's actual appearance is highly uh, dissipated and no two uh, our features are from are similar no two tomes il feature illustrations are similar um, it's hard to read that so I'm gonna stop reading that um, but that's okay. It's just meant to give you a taste of how the pages look. So we'll read read the interior here to have an easier time of it. But it's 81 pages, so it's a good amount of pages. And uh, you've got your table of contents here. So all these different creatures, including the Bloody Hag, uh, Pocked Piper, Straw Man, Thralum, the Weaver, Were Rat King, all kinds of fun stuff. And then you got a foreword introduction and then first creature is called an aspirant and it's a little kitty so that's fun and uh then you got the bandersnatch which was the one we were reading earlier so yeah this version's easier to read but i love that artwork it's uh it says there have been the odd tale or two of past heroes claiming they had regained a limb by taking from the bandersnatch itself yet no living person can confirm this when heroes manage to track down this fabled tempest of flesh and bone, they soon find out that while limbs can be acquired by taking them from the banner snatch, its living purpose is is to grow by stealing limbs. So it might try to steal the limbs. Um, it says it possesses a horse-like head at the core of its torrential mass of limbs. When the banner snatch grapples a creature tightly, its gaunt, elongated head emerges to bite and swallow entire limbs, which immediately emerge as the banner snatch's own. That's cool characteristic and you can kind of see the horse head coming out here in the artwork um if a limb is removed from a living or freshly killed bandersnatch that limb can be magically attached to a body by holding it in place for one minute enabling adventurers to replace lost limbs or for the creative and chaotic enough to gain an extra limb any extra limbs can be rudimentally uh, rudimentarily controlled to perform the simplest of actions such as carrying objects so really fun concept and you can see that carries through into the stat blocks. You've got claw and grab, bite, snatch. The bander snatch removes a limb from a creature that is bander bitten, dealing 36 piercing damage. The stolen limb is removed and the wound is magically sealed. Uh, so very fun. And then it's even got a reaction called a sacrificial limb. So just that creature alone seems a lot of fun. I mean, there's so many options in this creepy monster compendium, which definitely lives up to the name. So whether you want to use it for next Halloween or you want to use it for Ravenloft or even just to have on hand to mix up these these creatures. If you have a character that's lost a limb and you're looking for a creative way to get that limb back, you can use the Bandersnatch, right? So I'm liking it. I think there's probably a lot more fun stuff in here. So you got to check out the whole thing by clicking Creepy Monster Compendium in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Deep Night Chase, an adventure module uh, from the GM Secret Stash. It says a tier one to two one shot adventure from Quick Fix Club. It's got a suggested price of zero dollars on pay what you want for 23 pages. It says it's the story of an all night chase through an enchanted wood, flexible adventure length through modular encounter design. It's got builds for eight new enemies and monsters, table for rolling encounters in a dark wood, several maps that can be used online on an online tabletop such as Roll20. Says the story, it was supposed to be a simple campaign to boost the popularity of Dareg of Kelm, Prince Regent of the Realm. Dareg came to power due to his father's recent sickness, and although he was gifted with the sword, the citizens of Kelm did not put much faith in the spoiled little princeling who has built himself a reputation as an incorrigible womanizer and braggart. Seeing as there had not been any wars to earn a name for himself in recent years, Darg thought it would be a great idea to take the king's cavalry to clean out Kelm's wild hinterland. The locals have petitioned the prince for a while now, warning the bands of goblins nesting in this ancient forest. Clara have grown more aggressive. 
Rumors of them amassing an army have been spreading like wildfire. Flyer. As a show of force, the prince mobilized his knights to camp outside Clara. First scout reports confirmed the rumors, warning of a small warband of goblins moving in on the camp and arriving in about seven days. Not further questioning the goblins' possible motivation, Derek ordered his knights to secure the camp and wait for the goblins to arrive. As a concession to his spy master, he also sent out a small scout camp to um, team to keep an eye on the warband's advance. At that point, he probably didn't realize that the kingdom's survival would depend on them completing their mission. In this three to eight hour adventure, a party of four to five level characters is hired to spy on an encroaching goblin warband. Yet before they can even begin their assignment, they make a horrible discovery. Kelm's survival now depends on bringing this knowledge back to Dorag through a deadly deep night chase. So, wow, look at this fun map. And another fun map. Lots of fun maps. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Little spaces here. Yeah, very fun. Let's take a look inside. You get to see eight of the 23 pages. So, yeah, I like that this is a chase. Chases are hard to run. So, if that's the focus of this adventure then hopefully they've figured out how to do that and um, it'll just be a fun a fun time it's got potions trinkets and rituals at the end and uh wandering forest lost in the dryad woods so it seems like yeah all these modular encounters spider in the attic constant threat of search parties the goblins are organized into search parties which usually consist of one to two warg mounts Four goblin foot soldiers or goblin leaders and someone leading the search party, either a hobgoblin legionnaire or a goblin booyag. So, all kinds of goblin fun stuff happening in here. And it's it's basically free if you pay the suggested price they have here. Although you can pay some money to these creators. So, consider that. And check it out under Deep Night Chase in the links below. Give it a click. Next we have Divine Blessings Gond. By Zrave and Apocalypse. Um, it's a suggested price of $1.99. Pay what you want. Five pages. It says Divine Blessings is a series that aims to provide knowledge about the gods and items they might leave behind. Providing a story of the gods, their journeys, trials, and where they stand now. Throughout their lives, they have provided blessings in the forms of weapons, armors, and various trinkets. Taking inspiration from their stories, we create items that feel like a part of the deity. Whether they be relics found or an artifact bestowed to a champion. The god of craft craftsmanship, Gond, we can safely attribute many wondrous and beautiful creations to his blessing and inspirations. They are to inspire and engineer. Followers of Gond are usually found busy in the workshops, tinkering, trying to find the next big invention. For those who come into the possession of said inventions, find that their usefulness varies based on design. Some help in the process of craft and many in defense or protection and others meant for a more offensive purpose. So this is a series. There's a bunch of other gods down here you can see from the same creators. But what's cool about it is it's like focused on giving you some of the lore of the god and then going into some of these items and things that could be left behind. So if you want to bring the god in, you have the lore of the god and then you also have all of the things that they they could have, you know, either give to a character today or could have given to a character in the past that you're now finding secondhand. So looking inside, you can see here's all that information on Gond. And then down in here, you get to all these magic items. And it uh, looks like even a character that uh, may uh, be related to that god. So you've got artifacts like the Awakened Bastion of Gond's True uh, Greed. And then up here you have Arsenal of the Imagination, Wondrous Item Uncommon, a blank tome, a quill, and rare inks. Using these tools, you can draw a non-magical object that you have seen before. The drawing can then be pulled out of the page, becoming a shimmering copy of the real item, except it disappears after one hour. The object must be narrow enough to be pulled through the page, which is 12 inches tall and eight inches wide. For example, you could create a ladder, a length of rope, or even a flask of acid. Drawing an item on a page takes one minute and consumes two gold pieces worth of ink. And then there's a little 
Flavor text, this is the collection was created by a high-ranking wandering priest to ensure that he always had the right tool for the job. It was eventually stolen by the Zentarum. So, fun lore, fun items, and all this backstory on Gond, the god, and that's just one. So you could click the link and maybe check out some of these other gods as well. Uh, I would ask Zarave and Apocalypse if there's ever a plan to do maybe a bundle, because I think you could bundle some of these together and get some purchases that way as well. Uh, I think um, I would definitely be interested in a bundle because I know some of these are pay what you want anyway, so they're super cheap. But uh, you know, if you put a bundle together, you might might even make some more funds out of this because it looks like a fun series. So check it out under Divine Blessings Gond and uh, see if you like it. Next, we have Esmeralda's Handbook of Horror by Rajan Khanna. And it's $5.99 for 62 pages. Halloween may be over, but spooky season doesn't have to end. Delve into Esmeralda's Handbook of Horror, a source book containing new horror-based material for your D&D campaign as collected by the famous hunter Esmeralda de Avenir. So you get 26 new subclasses, a new lineage option, the Golemborn, new equipment and tools, new spells, new magic items, new monsters. No tricks, only treats await you in this book. So let's look inside. So you can see six of those 62 pages. So you can see kind of the layout. They've got spells, equipment, magic item, monsters, and all those subclasses, of course. Um, so let's see. It's telling you how to use the book here. And then you've got the new lineage and the Golemborn. All the traits on that. And then you've got the Artificer with the specialist flesh crafter. So let's look a little bit at the golem born. So it'll be interesting to see how they're doing the, yeah, okay. Cause there, there's typically an ability. I'm not sure if this is truly a lineage or more of a race. Um, yeah, it looks like it could be, yeah, it looks like it, it could be a lineage here. So, so it's interesting with, with lineages, the, the term race has had challenges. You know, people are not necessarily happy with how races have been betrayed in the game. And so sometimes you'll see people refer to races as ancestries or lineages instead of um, a race because of, because of the issues. And so when I'm looking at things like this and they say lineage, I'm not always sure. Is it an actual lineage as in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft lineage or is it a race that's being called a lineage. So um, they usually have a, a ability that gets repeated all the time and I'm not seeing that one in here. So this may still not be a lineage, I'm not sure. But regardless, it's either a lineage or a race. Uh, but um, let's read a little bit about it. So it says, uh, let's see, constructed of patched together body parts, the Golemborn are less an official race and more of a collection of individuals created through a combination of magic and alchemy. So, sounds definitely like a lineage. While the secrets to making flesh golems has been known for some time, it's less widely known that some artificers and wizards have developed those techniques into a way to create free thinking and intelligent humanoids. Such humanoids, known collectively as golemborn, are made up of flesh and bo bone and organs of other humanoids stitched together. That's a cool background. Got all the information, and they've got grafted upgrades. As a patchwork creature, you are assembled from pieces of humanoids. You can replace your humanoid parts with those from other creatures, granting you different abilities. At first level, choose one of the following. So then you've got all these different grafts that you can have, like a feral arm. One of your arms is a natural weapon, ending in claws, a tentacle, or a pincher. It is a natural weapon. You can use this natural weapon to make an unarmed strike. If you hit with it, the target takes bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage equal to your strength modifier instead of the bludgeoning damage normal for an unarmed strike. So that's just one option of the graphs. There's all these other ones like insulating layer, night vision, chameleon skin, organ redundancy, etc. And then uh, you get to see a little bit of the artificer called the flesh crafter. So again, more creepy stuff this week. We've got lots of creepy stuff from, from um, DM's Guild. And that Halloween spirit, people got into a lot of this stuff and they created books. And uh, it works for Ravenloft, works for a lot of settings. So if you're looking for something a little creepy, maybe you want some of these subclasses or you want to try the Golemborn, 
Look for it under Esmeralda's Handbook of Horror in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we've got Fizzban's Forgotten Magic, all missing knowledge about dragon magic. From Solar, the Arch Sorcerer, $4.99 for 35 pages. It says Fizzban the Fabulous, a true hero, but tends to forget some important things. Sometimes he even forgets his favorite spell. In the midst of all the fuss about publicizing his work on dragons and Fizzban's treasury of dragons, he passed on some very relevant information for adventurers and DMs. Here in this book, we have the expansion for spells and magic items that you couldn't find in Fizzban's treasury of dragons. We also present some spell casting options for 10 true dragons. So you get uh, two feats in here, one inspired by Balagos, and the other is unique to creatures with a breath weapon. Then you get some magic items, so there's almost 20 of those, and then 30 spells associated with, with dragons, monsters, spell casting for dragons, and stats for two chromatic great worms. Um, so that's cool. So if you're looking for, you know, some some information on having your your dragons do some spell casting it's in here or if you need like some great warm stats there's some of those in treasury but it doesn't hurt to have more and then lots of spells lots of items um, you know if you've got treasury of dragons or if you purchased my book i know a lot of you have the fizzbands vault of draconic secrets this could be another one to bring in some more fizzband stuff and and more magic more spells that are dragon themed maybe you're creating a world where there's dragon riders or um, dragons are like the dominant species so it could be really fun uh, let's take a look inside so they've got a fun cover with this cool red dragon you get to see five of the 35 pages and uh so you've got the character options so your feats your you're, uh, you've got a revised draconic bloodline, then you've got your magic items, everything from a blazing bulwark all the way down to a wild magic bomb. That sounds fun. Then your spells, you go from the anti-dragon aura all the way down to the ward mist. And then monsters, you've got chromatic dragons, and then various spells for each of the uh, chromatic and metallic dragons. And then you've got these two uh, great worms at the end. So got some, quite a variety of stuff um doesn't look like we're gonna get to read any of the spells or magic items it might be fun um solar if you're watching to maybe add just one spell or one magic item as an image in here so people can just get a, a taste of your writing and maybe get to see one of your items or spells um because it looks like you've got a lot of fun stuff that can go with a lot of books we've mentioned here so i think um i think uh it's it's really timely too there's a lot of dragon stuff so definitely check it out um like i said by the time you click on it there might be some of those images in here or even you could even paste just text of it in here solar if you wanted um just because i want people to see that you can you can write and that's a good way to do it because a lot of times well let's see maybe your alternate preview has some stuff too let's see Ah, we do. We have it. See, my bad. I looked at the quick preview, but you've got it in your alternate. So you got magic items, and here's the spell list. Oh, okay, perfect. See, this works. Sometimes you, there isn't always a alternate preview, so you just never know. So we'll read one of these for you in just a second. So you've got the dragon's innate spell casting. So it shows you how the spells work for the dragons, and then here you've got Tixjar or Chazar, the Undying. Just every week, you guys get me with these names. I think you deliberately name them silly things so that I have to struggle through this video, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, Anti-Dragon Aura, fourth level abjuration for cleric, paladin, and sorcerer. It's got a casting time of one action. Self is the range, verbal somatic, and concentration up to one minute. The spell creates a phosphorescent aura of protection around the subjects. It works like magic circle, but the effects of this aura only work against creatures that have dragon descriptor or draconic blood. So it's just a little bit of a different uh, magic circle. So yeah, see some fun stuff in here that you can read through, decide if it works for you. It looks like a clean layout with some nice artwork. So definitely a lot for you to discover in here. So I would I would say let's go to the links below and click on Fizzband's Forgotten Magic. Check it out. Next we've got The Masquerade of Ravenna. 
and it's by George Knox, $5 for 66 pages. Have you ever wanted to mix the risk, rich sophistication of aristocracy? Jeez, let me start that over. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to mix the rich sophistication of aristocratic houses, vampire clans, an empire very similar to the Byzantine, Slavic mythology, alchemy and runes into a setting? That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Do you miss the days of sophisticated vampires playing court politics or the intrigue of ruthless monster hunters paid to slay deadly beasts by using their sword and wits alone? This setting is perfect for the Domains of Dread. Feel free to place the Phoenician Isles in the oceans of the Domains of Dread. Maybe you yearn for gothic novels from the Victorian era, sophisticated masquerades, fine wine, and bloody murder mystery. So, lots of fun descriptors here of things, you know, gothic novels, those are always fun. Again, more creepy stuff. So this week, I think it's just the Halloween spillover. There's people just still in that frame of mind and releasing stuff. And that's great because there's still plenty of people playing Curse of Strahd or other Ravenloft stuff. And uh, this fits right in. And uh, Or it could just be somewhere else that you want to have something like this with vampires. And we've seen several vampire books this week that could go right along with this. This is a lot of pages, so you're going to get a lot of content in here. We're going to read a little bit in a second. You can see they've got maps. They've got all kinds of stuff going on. So let's zoom in and see some different things. It says, Thisbe is a lovely merchant girl and approaches the players, and she begs them to give her love letter to her lover, Pyramus, who is currently imprisoned in the palace of House Silverblit. Pyramus is noted as a famous bard, artist, and poet. The players see the young lordling Pyramus sitting in his balcony on his family's clan manor on his guarded tower. If the heroes can get a messenger pigeon to him, he can send a message back saying that he's forbidden to set foot in the greater city of Ravenna to see his beloved Thisbe, and instead he will be wed when the house Silverblood finds a suitable companion from either house Supervald or House Rotterham Hammer, right? So all sorts of houses. So you got all this vampire politics going on, which can be really fun. Reminds me of like Vampire the Masquerade a little bit. Um, and it's in D&D, &D, and you've got this whole setting of the city and um, different places. So you've got geography. So it's a little bit of a campaign setting here, but more of like a Domain of Dread. But that's fun. So check it out under Masquerade of Ravenna in the links below and give it a click. Next we have Races Reborn, Dragonborn, with this fun picture on the cover. It's by Sven Truckenbrot. For those of you who brought um, my Feywild companion book, Sven wrote the Dance of the Satyrs encounter, uh, the first encounter in that book, and it's a lot of fun. So Sven does a lot of good work here, and uh, so now we get to look at a title from Sven called, uh, called Races Reborn Dragonborn. It's 495, 37 pages. It says Dragonborn Might, Majesty, and Magic. Dragonborn are magic, and they are power. Their legacy is that of the most majestic and mighty beings in our shared imagination, after all, dragons. And the author says, I always found that Dragonborn were treated a bit like orphan children. They were always awesome in flavor. You are a mini dragon. What's not to like? But I felt their mechanics were lacking a bit behind their draconic lore, both in power and diversity. Power levels got fixed quite nicely in the treasury by Fizzbam. And we even got specific metallic, chromatic, and gem lineages, which is fantastic. But if you are like me, you might want more. I hope you have as much fun building unique dragonborn with this book as I had coming up with the concepts. Go on some awesome adventures and create great stories with them. So you have Becoming Dragonborn. Dragonborn are a fantastically diverse and varied people. This is due to the kaleidoscope of possible ancestors of their bloodline drawn from the entire spectrum of chromatic, metallic, and gem dragons. The mechanic in this book allow you to build your own ideal dragonborn with 15 lineages and a total of 74 unique new traits. So you've got the metallic dragonborn, the chromatic dragonborn, the gem dragonborn. So all kinds of fun stuff. And let's see inside. So really cool artwork. You get the origins of the Dragonborn. And then how to use the book. 
and there's a quick build and building a dragonborn and then the traits in the book draconic ascendance dragonborn shared traits and then you've got the metallic splendor dragonborn lineage traits all kinds of stuff yeah you're getting to see the whole book so Sven has been very nice to let you read basically the whole book before you decide to purchase so that means you really have no reason not to come check it out and make that determination for yourself so let's read a little bit about the sapphire lineage here sapphire dragons are unusual among gym dragons and that they are exceedingly warlike they do not revel in battle itself like gold dragons or white dragons but they study the art of war diligently Many of their games revolve around strategy and tactics and can involve vast armies and miniature representations of combatants laid out on artificial terrain. These mock battles are near inscrutable to follow for the uninitiated and can take days to complete. This is how Sapphire Dragons hone and share their skills and play, but those skills are also perfectly transferable to the real world. Even more so than Amethyst Dragons, Sapphire Dragons have an affinity to stone and can shape it as needed an outgrowth of their training and controlling and shaping the battlefield to generate a maximum advantage for themselves and their allies. They often use this ability to set traps in their lairs, and this knowledge makes many Sapphire Dragonborn hyper-aware of traps while adventuring themselves. So here's some of the traits you can get if you end up being like a Sapphire Dragonborn. And uh, that's, that's fun. So it gives you unique appearance as well like your horns are split into shards always hovering in place you cannot seem to shed the flex of earth on your scales and then let's read one of the traits up here student of war minor vocational trait you are proficient in the history skill and you have advantage on any check regarding recalling information on military strategy or tactics employed by a particular creature so fun stuff get to see the whole entire book so why not and it's filled with artwork I think it's a really fun option again you know with the the dragon craze going on right now this could be a really good option to flesh out your dragonborn uh you know whether you have fizzbands treasure of dragons my book any of the dragon books this is going to fit nicely with that um yeah there's dragonborn stuff in the treasury but you can never have too much right either those all these other variations there's so many different types of dragons because of the treasury alone um, why not have expanded options for your Dragonborn as well? So look in those links in the video description and look for Races Reborn and give it a click. Next we have Rock Tombs of Kibidos. Theros. Explore the Rock Tombs of Kibidos and participate in the ancient Kibidian Atlantic games in this mythic Odysseys of Theros adventure. By Ken Usman and Stormcrow Dreamscapes. $7.95 for 28 pages. So, over the decades, the Kibidian games celebrating the victory over the Tritons have become an important tradition for the local townsfolk. The opening ceremony is performed in the Temple of Eros by placing a golden ceremonial sword on the marble altar. It is said that this was the sword of Hecatomnos, which turned to gold when he slew the Triton leader as a blessing from Eros. Before each ceremony, the priest of Erebos takes the sword to the rock tombs of Kibidos and places it where the legendary Hecatomnos Hecatomnos rests. Then the youngsters who have come of age participate in traveling to the rock tombs and bringing the sword back to the town to kick off the games. Many Kibideans consider this quest a passage to adulthood. Unbeknownst to the Kibideans, a hidden danger awaits adventurers at the tombs. Rock Tombs of Kibidos adventure takes players from level 1 to 2. City of Kibidos, presented in this supplement, expands the world of Theros and also acts as a source book. The adventure is specifically designed as an entry to Theros. It's got um, handouts, detailed NPCs, four magic items, extended plot lines, and rules how to run the Olympics. So that can be fun. Let's look inside. So you get to see three of the 28 pages. So you've got the city here and the Rowan Games. That's a fun looking map. Look, Miletus and Setessa. Adventure summary here. Kibidos, points of interest. And yeah, lots of lots of fun stuff. So let's see. This is the 
The adventure starts in Kibidos one day before the quest. The characters can spend their last day participating in the practice games, practicing with the athletes, an amateur local sportsman, or visiting a temple or shrine to pray, shopping at the local stores to buy additional equipment that could help them, reading scrolls on previous ceremonies or Kibidos history at the library, or simply re relaxing in the bathhouse. The next day, the characters set out from Kibidos towards the rock tombs. Traveling to the tomb of Hecatomos takes around 78 hours on foot if they follow the trail. So you can kind of see how it's setting everything up for you to go uh, deal with what's happening in Kibidos. But you don't see a lot of new Theros content. I mean, out of all the times we've done this video, maybe two, three times. I mean, this is episode 27, and we've seen like maybe two, three so if you're playing Theros and, and you're not homebrewing everything or you want to stop homebrewing everything and you need a little help, I'm sure there's something in this book that you can you can take out and use, even if you don't use the whole thing or use the whole thing. But in any case, look for Rock Tombs of Kibidos in the links below and give it a click. Check it out. Next, we have the Ruins of Faith Edhill. It's a solo adventure. And it's a standalone adventure for one to two players while for, uh, with first to fourth level characters, suitable for any campaign setting. It's two ninety nine for 18 pages. It says, years ago, two wild elvish twins, Quinn Warrick and Miranellis Autumn Grove, <laughs> fled their childhood home on the far side of Mount Falder to escape the war, an overwhelming tide of goblins, hobgoblins, and their evil kin. The twins with their people left behind the huge oak trees that once housed the elvish settlement of Faith at Hill in their towering branches. Since then, many tribes of different foul races, such as goblins, kobolds, and gnolls, have vied to control the elvish sacred trees and the relative safety of those lofty oaks. Brave the savage foes of Faith at Hill in this original adventure. So, you can choose your own difficulty level. There's a custom battle map and four romanceable NPCs. And it's shows you basically what you can see and hear in these boxes and then um, your character then can make choices based on the descriptions so let's look at this one kennel this large room contains the guard dog's kennel in the far corner is a bedroll and it seems that sometimes the guard sleeps in this room so encounter wolf experience 50 gold 29 heroic encounter two wolves uh, near the guard's bedroll is a potion of healing. You can try to calm the wolf by making a animal handling check. And then, you know, it just goes through that process and you pick what you're going to do. Are you going to do the encounter or the heroic encounter? And uh, looks like fun. Here's uh, seven of the 18 pages you get a look at. It tells you how to play the adventure. And then the general store. Lots of artwork for you as well. The quest stat blocks encounters so this is about two dozen elvish rangers led by a druid sarvalar caldry wind their way through the mountain pass and down towards the eroded gully up towards the higher slopes you see the mighty oak trees of faith aldil so it's got some nice moody descriptions and then it says as you go closer some more information on that and general features etc so lots of fun stuff and the cool thing is you can play it by yourself or with just a friend. So check it out under Ruins of Faith at Hill Solo in the links below and give it a click. Next we have Secret of the Whisper Woods, The Curse of Stone Ham by Christoph Fitzinger. And it's for level 6 to 8. 1150 for 67 pages. This is a terrible curse is haunting Stoneham. Every 14 years, the Whisperwoods claim an innocent victim. The time is near. Can you break the curse? The sandbox-like adventure is suitable for four to six player characters of level six to eight. Fits into any setting and can be played with new and existing groups. You can conveniently integrate the content into your ongoing campaign or play it as a mini campaign. So three to five sessions of three to four hours playtime. Interactive scene overview, game, guides for game masters, VTT, 11 new creatures, NPCs, unique items. I mean, all kinds of stuff in this book. Let's see the publisher preview. So you've got the contents here of the adventure. And then there's an epilogue. And then you've got magic items, curses, monsters, corrupted fae. And then the credits. So here's the introduction. And abstract. 
And then the scene overview, I really like the scene overview. It's very well drawn here with this, this graphic. And then factions and relationships in the adventure. So you can see nine pages. Another nice little uh, relationship diagram. And then here's even your 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 layout of what, what you're gonna be doing. The tension arc, the whisper woods, Stoneham location. This is very well done. I love the way this looks and feels. Um, I was not expecting this to be so good. That's that's awesome. Tension arc. This is the tensions. This tension arc is meant to give you an idea of how the adventure is built and how you could run it. It is not a strict order of events and should not entice you into railroading. You don't have to check off all bullet points in a section. If you manage to create the right mood or for a phase or your players, just decide differently. You may and should skip bullet points. So that's very cool that they kind of give you that, but tell you not to force your way into it. It says the Whisper Woods are an old and densely grown forest. It originally got its name because of the little pixies, fae, spirits, and dryads who whispered hints to lost travelers to guide them out of the woods. Inside the forest, travelers were always enveloped in a feeling of warmth and comfort. Still, the forest isn't harmless, especially if the intruders ignore the whispers of the fae. The undergrowth gets thicker and thicker the deeper you get into it, and before you know it, you can never find your way out. Deep inside the forest, there's a secret fairy grove. The sanctum of the grove is connected to a passage into the Feywild, and it permanently permeates the forest with fey magic. So you see, you have this adventure with all this fun stuff, but you also have a way to get into the Feywild. So whether you're going to do Wild Bee on the Witch Slide or the stuff from the Feywild Companion, you have options to get into the Feywild and, and just so many beautiful pieces of, of maps in here. I mean, I love the Stoneham map. All the maps so far have been gorgeous. Really well done layout. I haven't seen anything by this author before and I'm really appreciating it. So I think you need to come check it out as well. It's under Secret of the Whisper Woods in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have the Shadestone Assailant, a murder mystery in five scenes by Raster Thornwhistle. It's a 46 hour adventure for six level characters. 395 for 12 pages. It says Cassio Delaire, a local scholar and member of the Mining Guild, has been sticking his nose where it does not belong. He's been investigating rumors that deadly weapons are being manufactured in town with a recently discovered type of stone. Feeling that he is in imminent danger, the professor reaches out to a party asking for protection and assistance. Delaire has been murdered just as the party arrives to meet him at his office. Can the party find the killer before they strike again? So you've got three maps, four custom antagonistic stat blocks, custom sound set from Sirenscape. So if you use Sirenscape, you get access to a, a, a sound set for moods with the adventure scene. So that's a really nice, nice bonus there. So here's the adventure, including some hooks to get you off the ground and some prep. And then information, of course, on Sirenscape and then all the chapters as well as stat blocks at the end. So we'll read the hooks in a minute because I like to read those since it doesn't give too much away. So it says the party can learn of the professor in one of two ways. Whichever hook you choose, it is important that the party receives and reads a note from the professor. It contains the first clue to opening the safe in his own home office. The note asks for help and rather oddly goes on about how this once glorious city was built on the skill and ingenuity of the woodworkers. The party receives a letter from the professor asking for protection and help. He has been investigating rumors about secret weapon factories in town and strongly suspects that he is being watched. A local contact passes the professor's letter to the party thinking they may be the right ones to help. So that's just two options here for your adventure hooks. And they've got the cast listed here, so you get to see four of the 12 pages. Pretty fun. Here's the professor's note, even, with a nice background. Yeah, so this could be a fun adventure. Another murder mystery. Um, you know, murder mysteries are fun. People like those even outside of D&D. So I think this could be a great time. So look for it under Shadow St or Shadestone Assailant in the links below. Give it a click. Next, we have Underbelly, the seedy side of town. Unique locations, monsters, NPCs, and rules for any campaign by Anja Svar and Bell Beth Jones with a fun cover. And uh, once again, we're kind of getting into the darker side this week, which is nice. So you could theme 
a campaign with a lot of the releases we've been looking at uh, have a lot of dark things happening in your your adventures. So it says ex- exploring the criminal element of any town or city, not your typical thieves guild. This is a compilation of criminals, encounters, and locations that make any campaign come alive. You've got 13 unique criminal enterprises, multiple plot hooks, 50 detailed NPCs and monsters, 15 magic items, a new bard college, a gossip generator. I mean, it goes on. Chase rules, games of chance, poisons, maps, you name it. They've got it. And so let's take a look at 21 of the 100 pages. So you've got the TOC, the introduction, underbelly skill challenge. Yeah, so that's a whole separate skill challenge you can do. The blue retreat with these NPCs. I like the layout. They've done a really nice job with that. Here's the gossip generator. So that's fun. Let's look at that. So you first you roll for a person and then connection. So I'm just going to pick a number 72. Let's see. What does it say? Prostitute. Okay. And then the connections got to pick a number between, um, it says 3d 12. So it'd be between three and 19. Let's go with 10 prostitute, uh, who's connected to a doctor. So prostitute connected to a doctor. And, um, then it says you can use the tables above to generate almost any sort of gossip. So, bounty hunter, history jeweler. A jeweler in town has a bounty on his head for past crime. He may have absconded with a fortune. So, yeah. So, in our case, a prostitute is connected to a doctor. Maybe um, up to no good. They, they're they doing things they shouldn't be doing. Um, and then you've got this blue retreat bathhouse map. And then you've got the map key for that buttoned up it's located at the end of a cold cul-de-sac with small wooden sign that reads buttoned up dressed to impress it's our or it appearance is similar to the surrounding buildings a bit drab but not dilapidated in contrast the interior explodes in cacophony of color and textures there's not a single bare spot in the entire shop bolts of fabric from canvas to silk and everything in between line the walls so fun you know description of a place and where things are going on probably that you know this is just a cover for you can do some magical embellishments. I mean, just lots of fun stuff, and the layout is really playful. It's a feast for the eyes here. Yeah, I love I love all the different styles they're trying with this. Looks looks like a lot of fun, and you can just have these rumor generators and criminal stuff and magic items and games of chance and just tons of different little things all in this book with this fun cover and cool layout inside definitely a different style which is nice you know you get tired sometimes of seeing the same parchment looking you know thing made with a online generator so it's nice when when there's a fun layout to to feast on as well so check it out under underbelly cd side of town in the links below give it a click Next, we have Unearthed Adventures, Calicary, 10 Encounters to Explore Ravenloft's Domain of Betrayal and Revenge, $2.99 for 54 pages. It says, Dive into Calicary, one of the most tragically terrifying domains of dread revealed in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Immerse yourself in this new setting with an adventure anthology that equips DMs with 10 brand new, easy to run adventures that can be adapted to any player level. This module uh, provides DMs with everything they need to start exploring Calicari or simply adapt these adventures for their own campaign. So you get 10 one-page adventures, 10 maps, 10 magic items and spells, and 20 NPCs. So lots of stuff on offer here. And as is typical with all the ones we've been seeing this week, they're mostly Ravenloft darker themed Halloween type stuff, which is awesome. So again, you can take this one, join it with some of the others that we looked at and just create a whole campaign. So you've got the encounters listed here, everything from Naga of Nila Karinji to the Marani Diaries. So you get to see four of the 54 pages. And I like that it's got this black background with white text that's different. And it's listing all the dramatis personae here. 
So it says the history of Calicari extends into an indefinite past, but its present and future are in your hands. So um, it easily gives itself to stories of gothic horror and intrigue, but that shouldn't limit you from shaping a world that best suits the needs of your players. And all kinds of information. It says Calicari is one of the greatest tragedies to reside within the Shadowfell domains of Ravenloft. Untold eons past, it was tranquil and lush kingdom that even surpassed the splendor of the shining south and the distant fair rune. The land prospered for generations under the just rule of the Vazvadan dynasty, always welcoming diverse thoughts, ideas, beliefs, and expressions, peoples within harmonious cultural tapestry. But that was so very long ago, and perhaps such legacies aren't meant to last. Today, the Dower Kingdom is torn apart by vicious civil war, with the betrayed Autark, Ramia, fending off the intrigue from her envious and conniving siblings, Riva and Arajani. The last heirs of this dynasty continue fighting on every front to decide the ultimate fate of the realm. So, gives you some background, you know. There, there was some information on these domains of dread and Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, but not, not everything was spelled out. So this really gives you some more information. So Panic Knot and Samir Alam have uh, written this, and it's only two ninety nine for the fifty four pages. It's a lot of pages for two ninety nine. So check it out under Unearthed Adventures in the links below. Give it a click. Next we have Warlock Archetype Lantern Bearer with this fun artwork on the cover by Sticky Hunter and Matthew Wolf. It's a suggested price of a dollar on pay what you want for four pages. It says, in these woods my word is absolute and in these woods you have but one choice, surrender. The Lantern Bearer hold their patron in their hands. This is a free archetype though payment is appreciated. And we will look inside. So you've got the credits. And then uh, you're getting to see the entire book. So definitely got a good reason to come check this out. So um, looks really fun. So first level Lantern Mirror feature. The lanterns you were gifted holds your patron's very essence within. The lantern casts a bright light in a 15 foot radius and a dim light for an additional 15 feet. If you make a melee attack with the lantern and hit, it deals one fire damage. You can summon forth the shadow of your patron for a number of minutes equal to your current warlock level and can do so for a number of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus, regaining expended uses when you finish a long rest. It is friendly to you and your companions and it obeys your commands. So, very cool. Uh, come wayward souls, 6th level. Your patron's hunger grows and now you must feed the lantern. When a creature within your lantern's light radius dies, you can pull a fragment of the creature's soul into your lantern. And then there's various abilities as a result of that. And it says, patient is the night. When you are in dim light or darkness, as a bonus action, you can teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see that is also in dim light or darkness. In addition, you gain the trance feature and are able to survive without sleep. Instead, you meditate deeply, remaining semi-conscious for four hours a day. So it's a lot of fun. I like the, the visual of the lantern. And there's all these little abilities connected to it. So I think this is a definitely a good one to consider purchasing, you know, if you like Green Lantern or just this n visual notion of carrying some object. I think you could have a lot of fun with this and it can be um, a whole story about, you know, what's the history of your lantern, you know, be beyond your patron, right? How did you find it? What is, you know, is it always the same color? in terms of the light it casts, all that stuff. So much fun you can have with this. So check it out under Warlock Ar Archetype Lantern Bearer in the links below and give it a click. Well, that's our last title for this week. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment. I will respond to you. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Splinterverse. Click the links below and support all these wonderful creators. They work so hard and sometimes don't get any feedback. So buy these books, leave them reviews and comments. And uh, if you purchase anything from those links, even if it's not one of the books we profiled today, uh, you're going to help this channel with a little bit of a small fee that we get from the affiliate program. And if you're feeling super nice and generous, consider buying one of our, our books. We've got four of them listed in the links below. You've got the Feywild Companion, which is 150 pages of all kinds of Feywild goodies from full adventures, bestiary, subclasses, spells, items, you name it, it's in there. Potions unlocked, 
print on demand or digital, over 100 pages related to potions, whether it's locations and vendors, to crafting, to potions, to plants, you name it, it's in there as well. Then we've got the brand new release, Fizzbands, Vault of Draconic Secrets. It's the perfect player companion to the Fizzbands Treasury of Dragons with subclasses for every class that are dragon themed, as well as a new familiar, draconic gifts, horde magic items, regular magic items, trinkets, you name it, it's in there. Hooks galore. If you're looking for adventure hooks, there's hooks galore in there for you. And we also have Van Richten's Librum of Lineages, which is filled with lineages and optional rules for lineages. They're all very unique. You won't find lineages anywhere like those. Um, and they, they're not just for Ravenloft, despite the title. So check that out. It's super cheap. It's only $2.99. So click those links in the video description. Help support the channel. And until next time, happy adventuring.